Testing.
Where in the fuck is this going? If I forget to walk. Yeah, no, we... Okay, is everyone ready? Are we ready on YouTube? Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Virginia City Council Chambers. Well, this is a regularly scheduled committee of the whole meeting. 
We have a rather uh, aggressive agenda today, so please be patient as we move through the agenda items. We'll call this meeting to order. Today's date is Tuesday, April 16, 2024. The time is 9 a.m. We have appearances today from uh, uh, Mary Garnis, uh, Brandon Larson, and Brian Rahek from St. Louis County regarding the property tax determination, and Matt Reed from SCH with respect to some issues, and then we have building and grounds, finance, and other items of concern. So we'll turn this uh, a part of our agenda over to our city administrator, Britt C. Bennis. Britt? Thank you. The first item on the agenda is Brian Grahek, Brandon Larson, and Mary Garnis from St. Louis County regarding um, assessments in the city of Virginia. Thank you, uh, and welcome. Thank you for coming to the meeting and give us some clarity on how this, these terminations are made. Mary, good morning. Good morning. And, and others, um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and share some information about our assessment process. Um, I think it will be helpful to answer some questions that have happened recently. Um, at the city council level, um, et cetera. But again, really appreciate the opportunity and thank you for your service. Um, so before I turn it over to Brian Grahak, he is our appraisal supervisor in the Virginia office, and Brandon Larson, deputy auditor, I wanted to share just a couple of facts regarding the totality of the work that we complete um, for the entire county. So the countywide estimated market value this year was $26,717,542,500. Quite substantial. And that was up over $2 billion from the 2023 assessment. Um, so again, quite significant. Um, of note, 78.87% of that um, value increase was due to residential property. So some of the value increases you're seeing in the residential area in large part are due um, to that valuation shift. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. He's gonna share some information about our assessment process, how we determine value, and then Brandon Larson will talk about the, the tax impact of that process. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Mayor. Council members, thank you for having us here. Um, before I get started, I just want to throw out there for for uh, the members of the public and for you guys, I did put some business cards in the back. If you guys have any questions at any time after the meeting, feel free to call. I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, so to get started here, we're just going to go through this slide presentation. We kind of set this up for, for boards throughout the county when they request this kind of information. Um, it's a little bit of, of the what, why, when, and how on the assessment process, and then a little bit of background of, of how it affects property taxes. Um, so to start off, you know, what does the assessor do? We value and classify property. That's it. In a nutshell, that's a summary of what we do. We do not collect taxes. We don't calculate taxes. We don't determine tax rates and we don't establish the property tax laws. Those, the, the taxes collected are set by levies throughout the county, whether it's your levy as a local jurisdiction, the school levy, Rock Ridge School District in this case, or the county levy. Those three le levies are set independent of our valuation. Those three levies determine what is gonna be collected by the auditor's office in property taxes. Your values going up or down do not create that revenue. It's just how they divide it up. So in St. Louis County, who does the assessment? Well, since 2017, it's been a true county system. I know I have saw at a couple of your meetings, it's brought, been brought up that you guys used to have a local assessor. Um, right around 2012, about right before the time I started with St. Louis County, they had a blue ribbon panel put together because there had been some equalization issues throughout the county with assessment. And that blue ribbon panel was comprised of, you know, realtors, property appraisers, assessors, um, community members, council members. And that panel determined at the time that there was going to be some liaison between the county and the local assessors. And that didn't really clear up the problems of the Department of Revenue and, and the um, 
Minnesota, well, I guess the Department of Revenue and, and state tax court still had some issues with the assessment that was going on, and the county decided to go with a true county system in 2017, which ultimately means now that the entire county is appraised by county employees, county assessors. There are no local assessors anymore. So why do we do the assessment? What is it used for? Well, it's basically the way that the state of Minnesota has determined to divide up property taxes. It's ad valorem property tax system, um, meaning that when the levies are set, those levies get divided up based on current estimated market values of the properties. And a lot of states do it different. You'll, you'll hear people saying, well, California does it this way, Maryland does it this way, and, and every state makes their own determination on how they do that. But then once the state makes that determination, that's how it's done in every county throughout the state. So all of Minnesota is following the same statutes and, and regulations that we are. So how is the assessment done? It's, it's a mass appraisal process, meaning we don't go out and find three comps for every property. We don't go out and get nearly as detailed as a lot of people believe when it comes to the physical attributes of a property. We collect enough to get a fair assessment, but it, we, we got to keep some responsibilities fiscally, and there is a reason that if you get a full-blown property appraisal, it costs four or $500. And on the other hand, we can do you know, 1,000 improved parcels and two to 3,000 if you include vacant land every year per person. It, it has to be done this way. It's mass appraisal. Um, so in mass appraisal, it's based on schedules. It's based on sales studies. It's not based, like I said, on finding three comps and making adjustments for bathroom counts, garage stalls, and that kind of stuff. And then ultimately, there's some statistical analysis after the fact to see how the level of assessment is. And what that's going to be is, is, are they assessed at market value, which we'll get into that later, some of the state definitions of what market value actually is. Are they fairly assessed? Are we overvaluing low-value properties or overvaluing high-value properties or, or something in between? Um, so there's some statistical analysis that, that goes into it after the fact. I could read this. I don't think I'm going to. Um, this basically just gives the difference between a fee appraisal and a mass appraisal. Again, like I said, a fee appraisal, they're going to find three comparable properties. They're going to do market analysis. They're going to make, make changes and adjustments to the sales, to turn them into the subject property, to come to a value. It's time consuming, it takes a lot of time for an appraiser to do that, and that's why they cost so much. A mass appraisal, it, it uses models to estimate the value, and the focus, like it says in that last line there, focus is to provide an estimate of value of many properties in a cost-effective and uniform manner. It's a way to treat everybody the same. It's a way to come to a value using the same methods and standards for all the properties. Obviously, there's going to be different values because everyone has different properties, but that's what, that's what the goal is. So when is the county assessment done? Well, it's a continuous process. We're always looking at properties throughout the year, but ultimately, when you get your value notice in the spring, that value notice reflects a snapshot in time of January 2nd. So the value notice that you guys just got in the mail recently, that's a snapshot in time based on January 2nd of this year. Um, we're not trying to predict what it's going to sell for next year. We don't know until properties start selling and we do that sales study. We don't know what it's going to sell for next year. And so if you're looking to sell your property, get an appraisal because especially in a moving market like right now, our value is usually going to be low because we can't keep up. But we're not going to jump ahead either because we're not trying to predict values. So as far as you guys are probably aware that we, oops, we had appraisers going throughout the city this summer doing physical inspections. We knocked on every door in Virginia. If people are home, we asked to take a walk through the property with them if it's all right to confirm the interior attributes of the property. If they're not home, we go from the exterior. We don't look in windows. We don't enter buildings, we don't go in fenced yards with animals, that kind of thing. Um, we will enter fenced yards if, if it's open to get you know rear elevation photos and stuff like that of the property, but 
our goal at that time is just a physical inspection, get our property records to reflect what's actually there. So the assessment process, and it's kind of broken down into, into five categories here, and, and this was, is what goes on throughout the course of the year. <coughs> Excuse me. So according to Minnesota law, the ad valorem tax value that they're using is the full estimated market value as of January 2nd of each year, which that is the price that that property likely would have sold for under open market conditions, which is typical, normal, competitive market. It's not what you would sell it to your brother for. It's not what your grandparents would sell it to you for. It's not what the mine might pay for it because they need it as mine land. It's not what the city might buy for their emergency services center. Those sales all get rejected in the studies. What the sales we use are arm's length transactions, willing buyer, willing seller, each looking out for their own best interest. Um, we don't let non-market factors affect our market value. So we stay away from politics, relationships, and you know, like if we know property owners on a personal level on any properties, we have different appraisers go to them, that kind of stuff. Um, we don't even want the appearance of an impropriety going on. So, so we visit each property at least once every five years. That's the statutory requirement. If it's improved, if there's a building on it, we go and view it once every five years. If people are pulling permits, and I know a lot of people ask, well, you've been here three years in a row. Well, there's an open permit for a porch that's 20% complete and has been sitting that way, so we keep coming back to see if it's done. Um, but otherwise, we're there every five years. Um, like I said, we're going to ask for an exterior, an interior inspection. We're going to take a walk around the house, verify measurements, verify our property records. Ultimately, our assessment depends on accurate property records, as accurate as we can get them. Um, when we're there, we're looking at the quality of construction, the condition of the property, building materials, characteristic of amenities, measurements and we're taking our photos we're not looking at personal property we're you know good for you if you have a nice boat in the garage we're not valuing that boat we're not valuing your appliances if you got the new wolf stove great we're not valuing it that's personal property and that's one thing that we we ask like when we call to verify sales is is was their personal property included a lot of people think we're just being noticey but we don't want to think that that property sold for fifty thousand more or was worth 50000 more than it actually was because they included a boat and a dock with it. We want to remove that value in our sales study so we're not overvaluing things. Um, I got ahead of myself. Uh, the other thing we're looking for is new construction uh, and demolition, and that's reviewed each year. We get all our permits from you guys, and we go out and verify you know, what things have been done and haven't, add them to the property record. If somebody does something without pulling a permit, we just add it to the property record. We're not permit police. We don't go running and say, no, they did this, did that. But we do want our, our records to reflect what's there. So when we estimate our values, we create our schedule based on sales. And like I said, these are the verified sales that, that we've called on, and they are arm's length transactions. And then we apply those schedules uniformly across the jurisdictions. I think I have more on reviewing sales a little bit, so I'm going to get a little more into that uniformly applying that schedule across the jurisdiction later. So um, we'll go into the classification of properties, and this is a short section here. Um, properties are classified according to their use as of January 2nd. Classification really takes care of itself. Does somebody live there? It's residential. Is it a, you know, are they there seasonally or recreational? It's seasonal rec? Is it a commercial? I mean, it really is just dependent on its use, and they're usually pretty cut and dry in how it's being used. There are occasions where it hits some gray areas, but once we determine the classification, when that gets to the auditor's office, and this is something that Brandon will touch on later, different classes of properties are taxed at a different rate. So basically an equal value residential property and commercial property in the same jurisdiction, the commercial property is going to pay more into that levy than the residential property, even though they're the exact same value because of that classification. And it is, like I said, it's part of Brandon's tax calculation. So getting into what we do when we review sales, um, 
we get sent to us from the state the certificate of real estate value, and it's an electronic certificate of real estate value now, so it's changed to ECRV. And that's basically, this includes the sale details of any property that sells in the county. Um, if it's land over $10,000 or if it's an improved property over $25,000. When we get that, we call, like I said, to check and see if it's appropriate for our study, if it's an arm's length transaction. If it's not arm's length, it gets rejected. And what that does, it's kind of the aim small, miss small. If we included every sale across the county, foreclosures, everything else, in reality, your values compared to your neighbors or compared to other parts of the county and stuff wouldn't be really much different relatively. They might all drop, but they would all drop. And when you see later how that affects the levy, you'd see that it really wouldn't change anything. But what it does do is spreads out our data so much that it becomes much less useful. If we aim at a small segment of the sales, we can see if our assessment level, if our data is accurate and if we have a good assessment. So that's a good part of the reason that, that we eliminate non-arms length sales. So then we get into our sales ratio study, which sales ratio, I know this is boring for everybody, I'm sorry. Um, our sales ratio study is basically our value divided by the sale price. If our value is 70% of the sales price, we were obviously low on that. If our value is 120% of the sale price, we were high on that one. Um, we basically work off the median EMV in, in any study area. Um, on the sales that happen from October 1st to September 30th of each year. So the values that you guys received this spring are based on sales that happened in October of 22 to September of 23, last year. Those are the sales that are affecting the values for the notices you got this spring. Now the sales that have happened since then until next September will be <coughs> for following years. So a lot of people might look now and see, you know, maybe the Fed's interest rates catch up and property values start going down right now. Don't expect that to affect your value for like at least a year because <laughs> we're looking at the past. We're, we're saying this is what it would have sold for, not what it would sell for now. <clears throat> so then we get into our, our sales study to measure our assessment levels. And, and again, make adjustments for the following year. And this is done throughout all the county and, all, and the entire state. And just a little note for understanding here, different classifications all under different studies, so your residential property isn't being valued, classed, or studied based on commercial sales. It's, you know, stuff on that order. It's not being based on industrial or anything like that. Um, ultimately, and I know this has come up a few times at our local board meetings, the state requires a study if there's six or more sales. It's a pretty minimal number. Virginia always clears that easily. They think this year there were 73 arm's length transactions in the study. So um, that six sale requirement is not a thing Virginia has to deal with ever. And once there is a study, if there are more than six sales in any jurisdiction, so somewhere like Pike or Embarrass, if they had only six sales, we'd still have to do a study and we'd still have to make adjustments. Then the state requires that our median on those sales ratios, so our EMV divided by what it's sold for, is between 90 and 105%. If we don't make that adjustment, they will. And when they come in, they just crank it to 100 across the board. Land and buildings, they just adjust everything. They don't try to apply it maybe in a part of the town that's seen more elevated sale prices than the other part or anything like that. So um, the one thing we do in St. Louis County that I'm not sure if other counties do this or not, right now we set our median for 95. We don't go 90 to 100 or 90 to 105. Um, reason being, let's just say Hibbing, for example, was assessed and their median came in at 91 and we didn't make any changes. So their assessment level, they're within state guidelines, that's fine. And let's say that year Virginia came in at 104. We don't have to make any changes. As far as the state's concerned, that's perfectly fine. We're within their guidelines, even though Virginia is effectively assessed 14, 15, you know, 14 percent higher on the median. It doesn't affect your local levy distribution or division or anything, but it would affect you know at the county level. 
So we do everybody at 95. It's, it's our way of making sure it's equitable, it's fair. Um, but that does create some yo-yo effects. It, it, it creates some bigger increases some years and some decreases some years because we're moving everybody to a, an exact point, not a range. But it's, it's just a more fair process for doing it. Um, some other statistical measures that we look at for quality and uniformity uh, is coefficient of dispersion, which, you know, we have to hit that 95 median ratio. We could have really bad data where we might be at 10% of value on one property and 300% on another and everywhere in between, and we could still put the median in there, and we could still have, you know, set our ratio to 95 but that's pretty poor data. That coefficient of dispersion is a number that we look at that tells us how tight our group is. And, and we do look at that when we're moving values around to, to hit our 95. There are different things we can do that'll affect that. Another thing we look at is uh, PRD, which is price-related differential. And that is, like I alluded to earlier, if we're over-assessing low-value properties or under-assessing high-value properties, that's considered a regressive assessment which we typically are slightly on the regressive side within state guidelines for sure, but we typically are undervaluing our higher value properties and overvaluing our lower value properties at some level. I mean, it's not a heck of a lot, but it's there. Um, so that is another thing we look at as far as our analysis. Um, ultimately, it comes down to equalizing values when, when it's all said and done. Like I said, we have to get between that 90 and 105 if, if it's below 90, we raise the value. If it's above 105, we decrease the value. Now, we go right to 95, as I already stated. So um, if we don't do it, State Board of Equalization meets, and they will. So we, we have to follow the sales data as it comes, and we have to have Virginia as a whole assessed at full market value, which is 90 to 105 percent. And if the state steps in and they do make their changes, there will be no appeals process. It's just done. So we don't want to let that happen. So here I kind of have a quick example of an array of sales. And you can see in this list here, you know, the median ratio, is, so it's the middle. We're not working on averages. So if somebody just comes and pays an outrageous amount on a sale that we can't reject for any reason, it's not going to affect the values as much as working off of medians. Um, you can see in this list there's nine sales. The median is at 88 percent. If this was the study, we would have to do an increase on this town. You know, would it be about 8 percent or something like that to move that 88 to a, to a one, uh, 95? <clears throat> so we'd have to do an increase, and if we did it, we'd do it on not only all the sales properties, but all of the properties that didn't sell too, because we're moving that whole schedule by that percentage, so everybody's value. Um, so ultimately, yeah, it is the sales that set the values, and I think when, when you guys look at the sales books and see the sales that are happening, last year when we started our sales study, I forget exactly where we were on our ratios, but we were in the low 70s, I believe. This year when we started, we were at 78 on a median ratio in Virginia. Um, this was a reappraisal year, so I can't tell you that we had to just do X to building and X to land to move that ratio up because with a reappraisal year, we're updating tables and stuff behind the scenes. Um, but I can tell you that our median in Virginia this year on a 73 sale started at 78%. So we were low. And that's after all the changes we made last year. And I understand that it's hard to understand sometimes how values can do it. I don't necessarily understand it myself, but the market will pay what it will pay, and we have to follow it. The market really does decide the values, not me, not our office. It's, it's people buying and selling properties. Um, and then a few reminders that I'd like to go through here for the board is uh, there is the Board of Appeal and Equalization training requirement. I know this gets brought up every year at the board meeting. Um, you must have at least one trained member. You guys have never had a problem with that. I do recommend that everyone sit through it. It's online now. It takes about a half hour, 45 minutes. It is, in my opinion, fairly inadequate, but at the same time, it's a start. It's, it's something that should be at least watched by everyone and, and give you a little idea and maybe give you guys some questions or 
you know, shake some things that you might want to ask us. Um, and then some reminders from the, from the training manual. It's assumed that our value is accurate and, 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 classify, and the classification is accurate. Um, the burden of proof to change a value is on the property owner. And just saying, you know, I don't think it's worth that much isn't necessarily proof. You know, we would recommend that you guys have evidence. Um, best evidence is always an appraisal, but like I said, fee appraisals aren't cheap. Um, I can tell you right now, personal opinions, as a property owner myself and working in this position, I see and value more properties than most people. And I can tell you right now, just by looking at a property or even knowing properties that I've lived in, I wouldn't know what they were worth without doing these sales studies and doing this analysis. Opinion of, in fact, that's a little exercise that the previous county assessor before Dave Suplow, who's there now, used to have them do. You'd have them write down a field value and what they thought a property was worth when they're out in the field. And they come back in and what, what they basically learned from that is you really don't know. The market does what the market does. So um, opinion is not really factual evidence. Um, the other thing is the board shouldn't be recommending changes on the ability of a taxpayer to pay their property taxes. Um, shouldn't be based on services received. I mean, somebody has to have the last road that's plowed. It's just that simple. You can't plow them all at once. Um, it shouldn't be for tax equalization. It shouldn't be, you know, so this portion of town pays more or less or anything on that order. Um, it shouldn't be a reward just for taking the time to appeal. I mean, I understand a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into these appeals. They take pictures, they come in, and maybe that falls into factual evidence at that time, but just for showing up to the meeting isn't necessarily a reason to drop somebody's value. Um, so what the board can do, so this will be at the local board of appeal, is you can reduce the value of property. You can increase the value of the property. You can add improvements if we have missed improvements that are brought forward. And you can make some classification changes. So what you cannot do is, and this is a big one that a lot of people try to come in, is consider prior, prior year's assessments. So for pay 2024 right now, if somebody comes in for a local board meeting with their tax statement for this year and want that change, that's beyond anything that the local board can do. Um, you can't reduce the aggregate assessment by more than 1%, meaning we can't, you know, at Virginia's local board, you can't drop the value of Virginia by more than 1%. Um, you can't exempt a property. You, you can't grant exempt status. Uh, you can't make changes to a property that you have a conflict of interest. So you might be part owner or relative of the owner, or something on that. Um, you can't make changes to a prop for a property owner that has refused us entry of the property. So if they were home when we were out there for revalue and we asked to take a walk through and they said no, we absolutely respect that. But at that time, they give up that appeal right without us actually setting up an appointment and going and taking a walk through with them. And that's part of why at every local board I always recommend that you guys hear the appellant side of the story and everything. And then we set up walkthroughs with them. And ultimately, this is a data-driven system. We will go and make sure our property records are accurate. And if they're accurate, we're going to stand by that value. If there's something to change, we'll recommend that change. Um, and then it will be up to you guys at that point what you want to do. Um, and you can't order percent increases or decreases for an entire class of property. So you can't just say, well, commercial values are too low in the city of Virginia, so we're going to add 5% to all the commercial buildings. That's not an option. So uh, some common questions that we get is, you know, I'm concerned about my assessed value going up. It means I'll pay more tax. The assessor's job is to generate revenue. If you lower values, the government will get less money. And with all these higher values, what's the government going to do with all the extra money they're collecting? You know, these are all common things. These are questions I asked before I started doing this 12 years ago. And they definitely seem like legitimate questions. And they deserve answers, so we'll come back to that. 
Um, there are a lot of things that affect property taxes. It's a, it's a complex system, and as Mary mentioned earlier, St. Louis County has 150,000 taxable parcels in it. Um, we can't say what's going to happen from one year to the next. Levies change, taxable values change, properties go exempt, properties come out of exemption. There's just too many moving parts. So coming back to the question, you know, I'm concerned about my assessed value going up. It means I'll pay more taxes. Not necessarily. Like I mentioned earlier, Embarrass saw a lot of changes a couple years ago. And in going through it, I saw many examples of property values that went up and taxes dropping. They didn't change their levy at the time. The county's impact was minimal, and the school district didn't change anything. Their value went up, taxes went down. You know, it's not the norm, for sure, because values, property taxes, everything else, they're kind of like the stock market. They always move up and to the right, but it's not a cause effect. Or your property value going up isn't necessarily what's causing property taxes to go up. Um, it's correlation for sure, but it's not cause effect. Uh, it's the assessor's job to generate revenue. No, nope. what we do doesn't generate any revenue. It doesn't create revenue for the city. It doesn't create revenue for the county. It doesn't create revenue for the school. What we do is just how they divide up the levies. The the amount the revenue is determined by. Those, those varying govern, governing bodies. Um, if you lower the value, government will have less money to spend, and that is kind of the same as you know, with all these higher values. What's it, what are they going to do with the extra money? Like I said, it doesn't have either effect. It doesn't create extra money, and it doesn't lower what's getting collected. Ultimately, the city of Virginia, whether your property values double tomorrow or get cut in half, they're going to collect Virginia's levy from the property owners. Same at the school district level, and, and then the same at the county level. So, I mean, I understand there's a lot of angst about in the city of Virginia, you know, some changes that have taken place recently, but the school district, you know, there's voter approved referendums there that have gone into effect and several other changes. Um, ultimately, your value, although it's part of the equation, is not the determining factor. So got some quick, simple examples. So we got a township levy of $2,000, and we got four houses. They're each worth $150,000. At the simplest level, ignoring classification, ignoring you know a lot of moving parts like a physics question on a, on a day without atmosphere kind of thing. But at its simplest level, they divide up that $2,000 because they're equal value. They're each responsible for $500. So now let's say the next year property values go up 20%. We got four houses. Now instead of being worth 150, they're worth 180. That levy has stayed the same, still at $2,000. The amount they're responsible for is still $500. That didn't change, even though their values went up 20%. Now there's so many ways to twist and turn this. We could put commercial classifications and a lot of different things in there, and it gets Super complicated, super fast, but at the most basic level, this is how property taxes are determined. Um, here's an example with some new construction. This greenhouse, they added a garage. Now their value went up to 200000 and everyone else has stayed the same. They're still at that 180000 The levy is still $2,000. What happens? Well, now that greenhouse, they did add some new construction. They changed their value compared to their neighbors. No, they're they're responsible for 542, but everyone else gets to pay a little less, and that's where you know when you guys attract commercial businesses and stuff into town, that's helping offset these levies. That that's a big deal. When you lose commercial businesses, that hurts. That's putting it back on the remaining property you know property owners. So, just for consideration. So ultimately, what's important for the assessor is fairness. We want to come to everybody's value using the same methods, using the same criteria. It's equalization. We're, we're not showing favorites, and, and a lot of people think that, you know, the assessor, you know, going with the old adage that we're out here just to raise everybody's value for more money, they think we're kind of jerks and sticklers about lowering value, you know, for whatever reason. 
And we're really not. If we see something bad in our data, we will change that and make lower that value. If we see something bad in our data that increases the value, we'll change that too. Because ultimately, we work for everybody. We work for everyone in town, everyone in the county. And if we have somebody overvalued, that person is unfairly paying more into that pie than they're responsible for. If we have somebody undervalued, and, and we could do this, if somebody complains to me about their value, I could drop their value and nobody would know. Nobody except that person and me would know, and they'd go away and that'd be the end of it. There'd be no conflict. But what I'm in essence doing is dumping a, a portion of that person's responsibility on all you guys, on everyone else. And we're not going to do that. So our goal is that each person, when it's ultimately said and done, based on this ad valorem system we're in, pays the right amount to tax, no more, no less. So that's the gist of it. Now, we could spend a lot of time on any one of these slides or with any questions. I tried to go through that as fast as I could. Um, any questions? And I, I would ask that any questions here, you know, especially if public wants to ask some questions too, keep them general. Um, property specific questions, I am not prepared to answer right now. I don't have the data in front of me, no information. I'll answer general questions, and if you have property-specific questions, I do have cards backed by the donuts. Grab a card, give me a call. So any questions from the board? I do, Brian, and then we'll go <coughs> around to the council, and then there's people for the general public are welcome to come up and ask the question. So for me, my, as a, as a taxpayer in Virginia and as an elected official, really my only concern is for the the taxes that the citizens pay in the city of Virginia, commercial residential properties, but primarily the residential properties where we get all the questions about. So correct me if I'm not accurate here, if you would please. So about 50% of the property taxes that the residents pay in Virginia are equated to the city of Virginia's levy. I think that in, sounds about right. In, right. Right about that, right, 50%. So uh, if if we at the Board of Equalization was to uh, change up to 1%, which is which allowed by law. If we were to say a property is valued at uh, $800,000, and we reduce it by $100,000, and it's within that, obviously within the 1%, but that $100,000 reduction that we make to that particular residence is spread out to other parts in that particular quadrant, is that correct? Or the entire community? The entire city. Oh, the entire city, okay, thank you for that. And then, um, so who sets the estimated market value in Virginia? Well, we do, based on our sales studies. Good, yeah, thank you very much, based on the sales study. And so, um, so say for, uh, if Virginia was to have a 0% levy in 2025, as an example. So, uh, and people say the property value is at $500,000, the city keeps their levy at zero, it doesn't change. So the, 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 uh, uh, the taxes, the city taxes that the people pay from 24 to 25 would be flat for the most part. I, I, I mean, for, 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 for Virginia. Yeah, assuming no value changes and everything else, it'd right. probably stay roughly flat. Brandon can speak a little more to that, but yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Correct. So, yeah, and I just want to keep the question in general, because if, if, uh, if the market value is at $500,000 and the market value doesn't change, and we're at zero percent levy. Uh, the taxes that they pay the previous year will be the same. It would remain flat, unless yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> Roughly. Yeah, there, there's other factors that. Essence, yes, but there's different. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Thank you, Brandon. I'll have a question for you at your presentation with respect to uh, the fiscal disparities and how that affects the raising and lower the taxes. So my last question to you, Brian, and I may have some more after this, is that, so say that for the sake of argument that Virginia has a negative levy. Say we, instead of 0%, we, we reduce the levy a minus 10%. So would somebody's, based upon the simple formula that you had, would, that, would people's property taxes that were flat, would that be reduced? It would be. Okay. 
Thank you. I have a few more questions, but I'll leave it at that. Uh, Councillor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for that great presentation. Um, so I have a couple questions. If you could explain the correlation with the EMV, the estimated market value, and the levy. So there's three different entities that are able to levy. Well, there could be more. An HRA could also levy. An EDA, I believe, could also levy. But the, the three main would be the, the school, the county, and the city. And then when you had stated that when you do the EMVs and the, they go based on the sales book, the comps in the area or whatever, on the, on the sales in that quadrant or section. In fact, I was just looking for my sales book and I couldn't find it. So I wanted to look at, I couldn't remember all the areas, but I think there's six. I think there's more than that in Virginia. Is there more we have in Virginia? Quite, okay. in a, quite a few economic neighborhoods, you know, okay. based on sales. So there. based upon that, when you had stated that... Um, based on that EMV new assessment, you're not generating revenue, but what you're doing, if you could explain this to me, what you're doing is you're giving, um, you're giving a higher rate for those three entities to base their levies upon. So if you're increasing the overall EMV of this, the community. I think I understand your question here. And, and ultimately, that rate and Brandon will speak more to this, is, is a function of the levy that's set, and that rate is just to basically equate that levy to the EMVs. So Can if, you repeat that? So if, if, if we lower everybody's estimated market value down to like 10% of what it is, and your levy stays where it is, Brandon would calculate a higher rate to apply to that value to end up with the total levy that you had set. If we double or triple everybody's value, then Brandon would calculate a lower rate to apply to everyone's value to come to the levy that you set. Ultimately, our values are just how they divide up the pie. So that rate is just a function of how big is the pie compared to the value so we can divide them up, right? I would love that. Yeah, he's got his, yeah. He, he does have some and slides here for explaining the tax I'm side of it. I'm sorry if I'm getting ahead. There's a lot of specifics on yeah. tax. And, so I can... and I can yeah. wait. That's, that's fine if you, whatever, however you want to do it. Sure. So any. Oh, thank, you. You. An older one, but... thank you. Any other questions for the assessment side of it? Um... Any questions from the council with respect to this? Uh, Councilor Motley. So, what is the number one determining factor on properties <clears throat> taxes being or raised on a resident? Number one factor. Yeah, because I'm trying to. I just want to reiterate so, this to the council. Like, what's the one contributing factor that it's so a local government? It, so it I know can it, be a lot of things. That's it, it's hard to nail it down to one thing. It, there are so many moving parts here. I mean, obviously, the value is important, and it, it's what's more important is your value in relation to everybody else's value in that taxing jurisdiction. So your value compared to everyone else's in Virginia is what is going to be important when they divide up Virginia's levy. Your value compared to everyone in the school district. So, so the levy. And then the levy is the, the, levy the is common the denominator. One. It's important for and sure. If, and what are the three levies in Virginia? It's the city, it's the, the county, and the school. Those are the main three drivers. There's some other minor things. So the city of Virginia taxpayers, what's the number one cause for a tax increase on them? Would it be we, the council, with the levy? Um, it would probably depend on the year. I mean, look, look at Rock Ridge School District a couple of years ago. That might have been the biggest thing that year. <laughs> you know, it's hard to nail it down to one thing. Okay. The levy's important. The value's important. Um, school referendums are important. Everything plays into it. Okay. But and definitely the levy is an important part of it. Yeah, I will, I will hope that this fall when we discuss the levy here, it's not at 36% like it was last year. Um, another thing, can you explain to me, um, just because I do know a few Taxpayers are moving out of Virginia to Mountain Iron because the taxes are cheaper, or that's what they're telling me. Can we talk a little bit about that? Maybe some personal opinions on okay. it, maybe, but I don't have data to say anything okay. necessarily about it. What, what would the question be specifically? Why are Virginia taxpayers saying Mountain Iron's cheaper? I'm just throwing this. Yeah, I, 
That could be a lot of different things. And it might be, I don't know what mountain lion's <coughs> levy is. I don't know, you know what their total EMV is. There's a lot of different things. There could be the ratio of commercial to residential. Um, it, if you live in a town that's got four houses and they're all worth a million dollars and they got a $2,000 levy, and the town next door has four houses worth $100,000 and they have a $2,000 levy, in that town they're going to pay like essentially the same. And somebody's going to wonder why can they get away with a million dollar house over there, where if you had a million dollar house with three other thousand dollar houses, you're going to pay almost all the levy, <laughs> you know? So it's value distribution too. It's, it's how many higher value properties are there, lower value properties, commercial versus residential. There's so many moving parts. It's almost impossible to nail it to one thing. Thanks, Brian. One last thing. Yeah. Um, because I had talked to somebody once last year when things kind of skyrocketed with the, the levy. Um, can you talk to me about sunsetting with the property taxes? We had briefly discussed this prior. So with the property tax, the increase in estimated market value, and I think is what you're talking about? Phases. Where it phases in, where it can only go up like a certain percent per year? Yeah, where yeah. it would be held. Um, that... They let sunset back like in 2009, 11, somewhere around there. I don't know exactly when it was. It was before I started here. And I think that was more of a function of they couldn't keep up with the housing bubble. And it, I, I don't, it was a legislative decision, so I can't say for sure. But I assume it just came down to, at that point, everyone was just getting the maximum increase in value allowable by statute because they couldn't even come close to keeping up with sales. So it made it a relevant number at that point. So then when you get new construction coming in, I could see that being a problem. And this may or may not be why they did it, but if you got new construction, it's its first time being valued. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's going to be valued at you know, full value, where other people that have owned these properties for years, they're, they're still only valued at like 70 or 80% because the values can't keep up. Okay. So I can see why there's problems with it, but legislatively, I don't know why they made that decision when they made it. Thank you. And one last thing to I, you, and Mr. Mayor. Um, has this city ever gone in a negative levy? No, Sherry? Uh, not, Sherry? Not, no, yeah, I'm sorry, Mayor, Councillor. Not that I'm aware of, at least not in my time. Is that ever something to be considered in the future? We've gone zero, but... Okay. We've, had, we've been at zero. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to, sure. if, if I may, I'd like to take each individual present taken separately uh, uh, for for uh, pertinent questions with respect to from from uh, Mr. Grahek. So, is there anybody in the audience that has a question, a comment uh, with respect to the presentation given by Mr. Grahek thus far? Uh, you're welcome to come forward if you like, or you can reserve your questions later. But you're welcome to come forward now. Uh, thank you. Uh, please come forward and, and uh, state your name for the record and welcome to Good. the committee of the whole meeting. Good morning, Kerry Washke Kali. Resident business owner in Virginia. Um, based a little bit on your presentation, but then I think your question as to um, the comparison for Virginia resident versus the Mountain Iron resident. Um, part of what I've looked at is okay. I've we've been through the appeal process on our value of our home, and that's really. We'll agree to disagree at this point, right? And so if I just look at the value of our home versus a comparable in the unity edition, finding three homes that were within a range of seven to $9,000 of our EMV, we are nearly double the tax that unity pays. So just making reference to what your question was. That I took three homes. The, the value is about the same. Not suggesting that I necessarily agree with the value. That's not. It's an opinion at that point. But the tax is almost double. Okay, thank you. And I think that we'll get to that. Uh, I'll have another question about that as, as a factor moves forward with uh, what other revenues they have to keep their levy at zero percent as opposed to the revenue up to we have. Sir, please come forward. Thank you. Uh, and uh, if you have a question uh, uh, from. Uh, Mr. Grahek, uh, please welcome. Uh, please state your name for the record. Thank you. I'm Brandon Suppola, um, homeowner, business owner in Virginia as well. Um, I went through, um, part of it is the EMV. Yes, it, it, you know, 
As far as I'm concerned, it's probably within a range of where, where it should be. My other concern, though, is when you take the EMV of my house, and I looked in Mount Iron, I looked in Gilbert, and I looked in West Evelyn. I looked at all three communities that would have similarly aged values. Mount Iron, half. Um, Gilbert, which used to be the highest in taxes, I mean, everybody used to complain about Gilbert, their taxes are 25% less. I mean, they have, no, they have very little commercial development in Gilbert right now, and they're able to keep their taxes less, you know, in the similar value home. West Eveleth, the same, because I've talked to some people that they, they want to leave West Eveleth now because taxes are getting high there. They're about 25% less as well. So, to me, the assessment, which you guys come up with, obviously you're going off of sales. I could argue there's some that sold that they're still value low, whichever, that's neither here nor there. Um, my big thing is, there's a spending problem. There's a huge spending problem right now that is causing us to get taxed out. I am looking at trying to do some commercial development. And I am a little nervous about doing that. I know commercial is a little different, how they tax it, but obviously how it's going to get assessed is going to be another big part of it. So there's all this stuff that goes into it that it's like, all right, you know, the collective, everybody needs to get together, and I do applaud you guys for keeping the levy low. Yes, you know, and I know Virginia is kind of a regional hub. I mean, that's been talked about before, whether it's, you know, the comments were on the fire department, it's regional, you know. Us taxpayers bear a huge burden for that. Am I opposed to that? No. Because I really want that ambulance to go take care of a relative that's up in Tower or a relative that's somewhere else. I mean, I want to make sure that that can happen. But that's got to be done a little bit more fairly. I know there's some recent comments where, you know, we have a fantastic library. We has a great breakfast connections there and, and whatnot, too. Um, again, there's a lot of regional people that come in and use that as well, which is a, probably a lot of what's used, too. So we have to be cognizant of the taxpayers in Virginia to make sure that, yes, and I'm willing to pay my fair share, I don't think right now I'm paying my fair share. Something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Seppala. Anyone else for questions? Councilor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I don't know if this is, I think I was going to reserve a few of my comments or discussion with uh, um, Brad, but Brian, um, or Brandon, sorry, I just <laughs> said that wrong. So I have a question regarding, so if you're looking, I just wrote down the, the locations. Um, so say you've got a, a house in College Park, and it sold, and it, it was a beautiful house, but some of the other properties around it aren't as beautiful. And everybody in that section is going to get, base, get their EMV or their assessment based on a couple of those sales. So say you had some really nice houses in any of these 16 areas. How, how is that, like if you've got a house that's almost blighted or it's a rental, how, how can that be justified with that type of a formulation? So Basing that when, comp yep. or on the sales book on a couple properties that sold in that section, yep, in that, maybe not every house in that whole section is up to that. So that's kind of part of a function of what we're doing when we go around every fifth year and, and look at the physical attributes. I can try to briefly explain how do we come to a value. Um, this gets really deep really fast, but basically we go out and we measure square footage, bathroom count, finished basement, if there's a sauna. You know, we collect uh, all the attributes about the property. So you got your nice house, extra bathrooms, finished basement, whatever, and then you got the rundown lighthouse next to it. We collect its attributes too. So when we come back, we put that information into our mass appraisal program, and we have cost tables built in there from Marshall and Swift, which basically it's a construction cost guide used by you know, appraisers, insurance adjusters, and stuff around the country. And based on that information, we get a replacement cost new. Now, the, the nicer house, better house is going to have a higher replacement cost than the other one, so it's going to start with a higher value. 
And then and those things are taken and they're and factored then, in. Yep, and then we factor in the depreciation for aging conditions so that old house is going to get you know, more depreciation. And then we take that depreciated value once we've calculated replacement cost new minus the depreciation, and then we apply the sales to that. So on the median sale in that neighborhood, it's selling for this much of that depreciated value. And we've done that to all the properties now. So when we have to move that median sale up 10% to put it in line with sales, that higher value property goes up 10%. So does the lower one, but one of them's going from here to here and one's going from here to here. So they are valued different. They are valued based on the physical attributes of the property. Now an economic neighborhood, you know, just one neighborhood's gonna sell different than another. So we might make, you know, based on sales, you know, we have to bring all of Virginia to 90 to 105, we go for 95. It doesn't mean all of Virginia is gonna move the same. Properties in Midway sell different than properties around Second Avenue, which sell different than properties up by the golf course. And those economic neighborhoods, if we see one part of town where we're running really low and another part where our values are good, the part where the values are good, we're not gonna change. We're gonna move that part that's low and try to move the entire town to that 95 by moving those values, not everybody, because their values are already at 95. Okay, and then when was the um, when was the percentage between the 90 and 120 percent or whatever it is? 90, 105. Uh, or 105. When was that? Uh, was that a legislative action? And what year was that? Was that has that always that was, been the case? As long as I've worked here, that's been the case. I don't know. It's as far as I know, that's so always been, been the case. So it's been a long-standing 90 yeah. percent. Yeah, 90 even, to 105. Even, even when we had our own assessor. Even when we had our own assessor, yeah. we had to follow that, yeah. that guideline. Okay, and then um, if, if I may, Mayor, and I don't know if this Please, is getting into um, more with Brandon, but on the sales book, what, when I noticed in the last couple of years that I've been on um, the Board of Appeals and Equalization um, meetings, that the commercial, like I would say more your downtown district, is severely low. And, of course, that's based on the comps that have sold those, you know, the buildings, commercial buildings. Um, in regards to what Brandon is saying, new, div new commercial would be pretty high. Those rates would probably be really high. And I think that might be part of the concern. But when I look at the sales book and, you know, buildings valued at thirty to $50,000, that tells me that they're not necessarily paying the fair share that probably should be paid on those that commercial district. Well, I, I don't know that. If it's based on ad valorem, you know, I'm not the commercial appraiser. That yeah. Pat Orrent, I, if you know, if you wanted to call him for some information about that, you know, definitely could. Um, he does the commercial appraiser. And but this is but, all based on a legislative. Like I'm trying to get to the heart of the matter: how we could change this. Some of this, like if it's broken, what can we fix it? But if some of this is statutory, there's not much that can be done. Yeah, he wouldn't over he wouldn't value commercial properties higher than they're selling for, or higher than what the market indicates, just because there's a perception that they're not paying their share. He's going to value them based on so. Yeah. On that, but like, say you've got a building that um, maybe on the tax rolls for fifty thousand, and now it's being sold for twenty thousand. That happens. Sometimes yeah, there's interior, you know, it's been gutted or something. We don't know about so it. Or, I'm concerned you know, so. as to how that valuation, you know, if, if a downtown is not maybe thriving, and I mean, it does boil down to they're not paying probably enough, but you can't probably use that language. I get what you're saying. But at some point, you know, our commercial district has to be. So, yeah, ultimately, like I said, we value and classify. We don't consider if commercial properties are paying their fair share or not. We don't, that's not part of our calculation. No, I, I, I understand where you're coming from with mm -hmm. that, but it's not something we even consider. And the other, when, when the other question that I had is if it, say like we were in the real estate bubble, like back in 20, 2008, and things go and they were at a balloon and they come down. I've never seen taxes ever come down if you're basing it on an EMV. So that confused me when you say that it's based on so market value. That actually is exactly what I was kind of pointing out here. That bubble values went up. Now taxes followed it because levies were changing and keeping up with inflation and everything else. 
Now, when that bubble popped, our values followed them, followed them down. Our values dropped with the sales. Taxes stayed the same because the levies didn't change. Everybody's value dropped, but the levies stayed where they were. So when they divide up the same levy on everybody's lower value, you're still paying the same amount. Okay, so that so. leads me to my next discussion, which is the correlation of the, the levy and the EMV. And, you know, we tried, the city of Virginia tried very hard to keep our levy low. Um, but how, does, how do we work together, the three entities that have the ability, and then the special taxing districts, I would assume, are like TIFs and things like that? The different types of ones. Okay, small amount on those. Um, but I, you know, at some point, we're going to tax our constituents right out of their homes, and that's a huge concern to me. Um, I don't know what the school property was or the school levy was this year. Was it like sixteen point four? Sixteen, and the county was pretty minimal, wasn't it, or was it three point eight? What was it? I think it was. Th so pretty yes, minimal. Mm -hmm. But b based on that, you're, you're going on that $2 billion increase. That's countywide. I don't know what the city of Virginia was overall. And then that's what's being divided according to the levies. Each, part, I guess, area pays that percentage of that tax, like you broke it down with those four houses. So it's truly levy-based is what you're, what you're ultimately getting at. But the, the formulation to, to do the EMVs, that's been a legislative formula for quite some time. The, that cannot be changed. Yeah, the, the guidelines they set, those ratios and what sales to use. And, and yeah, that and the is last legislative. question I had is how does that then correlate with how the city of Virginia gets local government aid dollars? Because I think that ties in. You don't know that for a fact. Okay, I had gotten to like a mini session, a couple mini sessions on how that, it's a very complicated formulation, which can only be changed at the legislative level. But I think for me, I would like to understand what we can do better to keep our residential taxes not from, from doubling compared to Mount Iron to the same type of home, the same valuation. And I don't know how to achieve that. And if it's a spending problem, we need to address that. Um, but we can't keep going up and keep assessing and assessing. Not only are we doing it for the school, we did it for um, now the streets, the new streets we're putting into place, and uh, a new TIF district we are doing. It's a, that's a small amount, but I'm very concerned, um, and I would like to be able to have this council put a plan together in place based upon all of these different activities and where that might, you know, I guess maybe it's just discussion with all the three entities that are taxing or levying. But at this point, you can't continue to increase taxes on the citizens of Virginia. You're going to tax them right out of their, or we're going to tax them right out of their homes. So I'm, I'm concerned how do we fix this and how do we address this? And I don't know if anyone has any suggestions on that, but, you know, we went through a really long struggle with our levy and trying to contain it in a very, uh, as low as we possibly could with keeping all the core services and keeping all of our employees employed. Um, but based on that, when I hear what, you know, people are paying in taxes, and it's more than Lake Vermillion on, in College Park, there's a couple properties in College Park that are actually paying more than Lake Vermillion. And how did we get here, and how can we change it is what I'm looking to solve and I don't know that that's going to be solved today, but I, that's the heart of where I'm coming from. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to get some uh, clarity on what, how the county runs their process. And we're getting that from you, uh, Mr. Garrick, uh, Ms. Garnes, uh, uh, Brandon. We're getting that for all from you. But the city's responsibility is basically to keep the levy as low as possible, reduce the expenses, it's just about generating revenue and expenses. 
So things have to change within the city of Virginia. We have to make adjustments. We can't control what the school district does. We can't control what the county does. But we can control what we do. By controlling the, the, the expenditures that we have and our primary expenditures with, for the tax levy for the residential property owners, the Arnton Memorial Event Center, our police and ambulance and fire service are the big events, and they're right into our budget. So adjustments have to be made there. And there's things going on at the legislative level to help accomplish that goal and objective moving forward. But when it comes into 2025, we're going to have to have some serious conversation how we keep the levy uh, to, the, to the point where wherever it's going to be. But at the same time, we have to reduce significantly the expenditures that we have in Virginia. And, that, and, and that's, a, uh, uh, that's a big conversation we're going to have this year for next year's levy. Uh, services aren't going to be, we're not going to be able to continue to provide the same level of services because the cost is too high. So we have to make some adjustments to reduce our, our revenues or our, reduce our expenses, keep our revenues, uh, you know, within reason and make, and that will help make the adjustment to the residential property tax owner. I think that's our, that's our job to try to do that. We can't control what the school and the county does. So, but explaining the formula, how that works is very helpful to us. So any other questions from the council with, for Mr. Grahek? Uh, Councilor Motley. Not sure if you can answer this, but I'm <laughs> going to put you on the spot. Sure. Would the quickest way to lower taxes for the taxpayers of Virginia be to put in a negative levy? You don't have to answer that. I'm just, I figured I'd throw it at you. Build a new mall? I don't know. I mean, it, potentially. I mean, that would that would in all likelihood that would help to lower taxes. But levy new construction for development, yeah. encouraging development. Yeah. It's encouraging development. So encourage development, yeah. and lower the levy. Yeah. New construction helps, and that's one thing. And I know the city doesn't have control over this, but like that Blue Cross building, that you know they paid a substantial amount into the levy. I think it was. Oh, don't quote me on this. I thought it was like seventy thousand, almost, or maybe more. I think it was eighty-six thousand. Yeah, something. That's what they paid into Virginia's levy as a call center commercial, with you know four point whatever million in value, and that went to a church is now exempt. That eighty thousand dollars is now being made up by property owners. The remaining non-exempt properties it just got redispersed. Thank you, Mayor. So, Thank you. Uh, so, uh, maybe if uh, no other questions, may have Brian come up, or, I mean, Brandon come up and, and speak. Uh, so, the question I would have is uh, for you, Brandon, as you come forward, I'm sure it's going to be part of your presentation. So, how does my computer went to sleep? How does uh, how does the levy? Uh, how is it affected by other revenue streams that the city has with respect to PILT or or Bindi's effects taxes? And those things. The higher your levy, the higher amount you get from there. The lower the levy, the lower amount you get from the city. So it's it's a factor uh, to be considered. So this is with respect to taxes. But like I said again, from my perspective, I think from all of us and those of you who have spoken today, it's about reducing our expenses significantly in order to uh, to lessen the burden of the of the residential property tax owner. That's one thing we could do. And any of the other factors that are associated with that with the commercial property uh, development increases in that regard and how that affects our PILT or money effects. So welcome, Brandon. Thank you very much. Mayor, councilors. Um, I think the power went off on the laptop, so while he gets that plugged you need up, to, okay. he, he's getting that plugged in. Very, very good, thank you. Um, to kind of address some of your questions you had originally of how does the levy versus the values, what's the correlation? Um, how tax rates are calculated in, its, in the most basic sense is you have basic algebra. A, you have A divided by B equals C. Okay, A is your levy. That's the numerator. The denominator is your value. Now, it's not just your market value. There's a how taxes in Minnesota are uh, calculated. Sorry, excuse me. As Brian had said, every classification of property has what's called a class rate. So homestead properties, they have a class rate of 1%. So what that means is you take 1% of your taxable market value, that's what's called your net tax capacity. Okay, So that's just one of the pieces that's used in this formula. As I said, every classification has its own class rate, which is set by the Department of Revenue and statute. So commercial businesses, it's a 
Yep. On commercial businesses, it's one and a half percent on the first hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and two percent on every value over that. Unfortunately, Minnesota has one of the most complex property tax systems in all of the U.S., and the number of classifications that the assessor's office has to deal with is astronomical compared to many other states. Um, so when you have the numerator being A, which is your levy, and divided by B, your tax base, equals your rate. Okay, So what that means is if you have a rate, you then have to multiply that by your tax base to equal A, your levy. So no matter what happens to your valuation, if your levy stays the same, that's all the city of Virginia is going to get. You're not going to get any more. You're not going to get any less. The problem is, is people, I know the, the big sentiment is, well, you raised, the, you know, the assessors raised everybody's value. Well, they didn't. They raised X number of percentage of properties, but commercial businesses might not have changed. So much like Brian had in that example was it was reallocating what share of the pie, who's paying it. Um, there's also is properties that they will find too where the valuation might go down. You typically don't hear from those people in terms of complaining about their taxes if their taxes go down, but that does happen every year. So it's important to realize that even though it seems like there's blanket value increases, it's typically not the case. So the, the bur what has happened, especially recently, is the shift on to residential taxpayers because and Brian can speak to that more. There wasn't as much valuation shifts in commercial properties as opposed to what happened in residential properties over the last few years. So now homeowners are having to pay a bigger chunk of that. Another thing that affects, and this kind of goes to what Mayor Cuffey was bringing up, is so you certify a levy. And then those cities and school districts and towns that fall within the Taconite Relief Area, um, they receive what's called fiscal disparity funding. Now, that fiscal disparity funding is funded by the growth in commercial industrial valuation since night. Doing a presentation without slides, it's fine. All right, um, so 40% of that growth that's occurred in commercial industrial businesses since 95, 96, what happens is a chunk of that valuation, 40% of that growth, gets subtracted away from your tax base. 40% gets subtracted away from the county tax base for, for, that, for the businesses that are within St. Louis County, but for the purposes of the city of Virginia, the growth in, in the commercial industrial value that's occurred since 95, pay 96, we take 40% of that, we subtract it off from your tax base. Okay, that, ta that tax base, instead of paying towards directly towards the city of Virginia tax levy or the county levy or the school district's levy, get multiplied by what's called the fiscal disparity area-wide rate. Now, there's seven counties that are make up our fiscal disparity area. So what happens is the, the money that's generated from that, from that business that they would otherwise be paying directly to the city of Virginia goes into a pool of money. Okay, so the Aiken County's paying, Itasca County's paying, Kuchiching, Crow Wing, Cook, St. Louis County. Okay, they're putting, that growth money is going into a pool. Then there's a number of calculations that go into how it's distributed. The main ones are going to be population shifts within the city, uh, residential uh, valuation, um, and what that resident or what that area's um, local tax rate was in the year prior. Because the aim of the program is to try to lower tax rates. To, to shift the, because there are certain areas of the county where it just doesn't make sense to start a business. You know, you're not going to start, open up a, a Menards out in the middle of Cherry, you know, because location, it's not going to be, you know, financial. So, but they try to reallocate those funds to try to help everybody, those areas that have higher tax rates, to receive more money. 
So the city of Virginia, the problem with it is the city of Virginia and the county and the schools have no control over how much fiscal disparity funds you get. Any changes that might occur in Itasca County, any changes that might occur in Aiken County, any changes that occur over in Hibbing, all of that affects the same formula. So it could be that you receive, so in 2022, for instance, I'll just give you actual numbers. 40% of your commercial industrial growth was about $540,000 in tax capacity. That's not, it's called tax capacity. It's not market value. It's a percentage of the market value. But you received, in terms of for the distribution, you received funds based on if you had $1.2 million. So what that means is if fiscal disparities didn't exist, your tax base would be $500,000 more. There we go. Your tax dollar or your tax base would be $500,000 higher, but you're receiving funds off the top as if it was 1.2. So what, what do we going to do here? Perfect. Okay. So we'll kind of go back and then we'll touch on fiscal disparities because I know that's. Not my computer. Oh, it's, it's the sharing thing. I'm not 100% sure how that works. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. We'll try this again. Oh, how do we go back? There we go. All right. So. The important thing is, is there's all different types of taxes, and it's all dependent on your classification. So we have what's called net tax capacity taxes. That's uh, taxes that are the primary tax that's paid. That's based on levies. So the county, most of the or all of the county levies based on net tax capacity. City of Virginia is based on net tax capacity. Um, school districts levy based on net tax capacity and referendum market values. Um, because if there's a voter passed referendum, it's only spread to those property classifications that are subject to referendum market value. There's state general taxes, which are paid by seasonal property and commercial property. There's fiscal disparity taxes, which I didn't go into a much on here because it's, I could do a whole hour just on fiscal disparity taxes. But that's paid by commercial industrial property, railroad, utility. It's not an additional tax in terms of all of this, it's an alternative tax. So what that means is because, as I was saying before, we're taking 40% of that growth away from your tax base, if we weren't doing that, they'd be paying that tax more on the net tax capacity, more on the referendum, but they're paying into this fiscal disparity. And then there's PILT, which is payment in lieu of tax, which is handled completely outside of what I do. So, <laughs> um, so the basics of tax calculation is you have your local budget, you have your value and your classification of the property, you have tax credits or programs that may reduce the tax due, such as tax and night relief tax, such as um, if you have a disabled veteran that can cause changes in terms of pro uh, property valuation, local government aid, fiscal disparity aid, those types of things will cause a change on that and then additional or state property taxes that apply to certain properties. So for the local levies and NTC taxes, you have the local units of government, you have counties, cities, townships, school districts, and special taxing districts. So all of those entities have to determine the amount of money they will need to fund your services. Okay. This money can be levied based on net tax capacity or referendum market value. It's all set in statute in terms of what types of levies can be certified based on what valuation. Nine times out of 10, it's always net tax capacity. Um, and then parts of these certified levies may be directly funded from fiscal disparity funds, or there's another aid called disparity reduction aid, which these aids come off the top before we calculate <laughs> rates that we spread to taxpayers. So we have the levy that you certify to us, all subtract off any fiscal disparity monies you're supposed to receive any disparity reduction aid money you're supposed to receive, and then that comes up to what I refer to as your adjusted levy or the actual amount of money the taxpayers are paying. So state law allows local governments to initiate voter referendum for various purposes. I said these are most commonly used by school districts. 
uh, or by other local governments for operating and or debt uh, purposes. For the state general tax, that the state uh, determines a commercial industrial state general tax rate and a seasonal residential state tax rate. That's certified to be by the Department of Revenue every year. Um, the Department of Revenue I said, certifies the tax rate to the county auditor each year. This is kind of very wordy, but this is kind of a basic explanation of how when you look at your property tax statement, you're going to see an estimated market value. And if you're a homestead, you're going to see homestead market value exclusion. And then you'll see your taxable market value. And so what ends up happening is up until this year, the maximum exclusion of valuation you could have on a homestead was $30,400, which is 40% of your first $76,000 of value. The important thing to remember, though, is as the value goes over $76,000, that exclusion goes down. And it goes down at a rate of 9% of every dollar over $76,000. So what I'm saying here is for a homestead valued between 76000 and 413800 the exclusion is reduced by 9%. And so and, and if your value of your house is over 413800 you're not getting any exclusion. So your estimated market value is going to be your taxable market value. The legislature just made change for this upcoming year in 2025 where the ex maximum exclusion is going to be 38000 which is... It, it, equates out to 40% of the first $95,000. So this is kind of an example on a $150,000 home. Instead of, you have the max at $30,400, it's reduced by 9% of the value over $76,000, so your exclusion's $23,800. Your taxable market value is one twenty six two. So the higher the values go up, the less exclusions you're going to get. So that's going to be another piece into why your individual taxes might go up at a higher percentage than somebody else in the neighborhood or, or you know, in the city. If property values in one part of town are going up 20% and another one is going up 10%, then that market value exclusion might go down more for that property versus the other property. So that's why it's kind of hard to explain why why is it if the city of Virginia raises their levy X percent, why is that not affecting everybody's taxes that exact same percent? Because there is so many moving parts. Not everybody's values are moving up the same. Some people's classifications change. Exemptions occur. So it's really shifting who's paying that chunk of the pie. So net tax capacity in terms of how it's calculated is based on this. So you have the estimated market value, which is determined by the assessor's office. We then subtract off any exclusions. Those are usually government, like I said, disabled veteran, uh, homestead market value exclusions, those types of things, to equal out your taxable market value. We then have to calculate a net tax capacity based on that taxable market value. And so what we, how that's reached out is you have net tax capacity is equal to your taxable market value multiplied by your classific what's called your LTC classification percentage. Those classification percentages, again, are dictated by the Department of Revenue at the state level. They don't really change much. We've had some shifts in terms of certain classifications, but such things for like homesteads and that, it's been 1% for the 18 years I've been doing this. It hasn't shifted. Um, so that's how we come up with, you take your, if you had $100,000 taxable market value, you're multiplying it by 1%, your tax capacity is $1,000. It's that dollar amount that I have to multiply by your rate in order to generate enough money to satisfy the numerator, your levy. Because the $1,000 is the denominator, the numerator is your levy equals a rate. So it's rate times value equals your levy. This, like I said, this kind of goes into a little bit too in terms of with fiscal disparities. So a taxing authority's net tax capacity. So if you do that calculation for every property in the city of Virginia and then add it together, that's your city net tax capacity. So you do that to every commercial business, every seasonal business, every piece of rural vacant land. They all have classification percentages 
You multiply it by their taxable market value, add it together, that's your tax base. So that's the denominator in the formula. But what ends up happening is then we also will reduce that tax base by, if you have a tax, TIF, tax increment financing district, the value that of any value increase in that TIF district from the time you set it up gets subtracted from your tax base because that's contributing funds directly to that tax increment financing district. You have um, high voltage, 20, vo 20 V or higher valuation on power lines. A percentage of that value gets subtracted off because that's taxed at a completely different rate that has no effect on you. And then we, re we subtract off that 40% of your commercial industrial growth from the fiscal disparity contribution net tax capacity. Because I said that's not paying, that growth isn't paying directly towards your city levy, it's paying towards the fiscal disparity pool. As I said before, you, if you, when you certify it, when the city of Virginia sends me your levy, I then subtract off any fiscal disparity aid based on the calculations of the changes in commercial value. Um, and all the, there's a number of different formulas that go into that fiscal disparity. Um, to then come up with what your spread levy is going to be, how much your taxpayers are going to be responsible for paying. So that's where I have total net tax capacity, power line, fiscal disparity contribution, TIF. You subtract those three off from your original net tax capacity. That's what's used for determining your tax rates. To your point or your question earlier, the main chain or main reason for value or for taxes not decreasing, in my experience, is levies not changing. It, what ends up happening, and it's a common practice throughout not just St. Louis County but the state, is many local entities or many entities focus on that rate that's getting spread to the taxpayers versus their, the budget, I guess, it's for lack of sense. They're thinking that if, they, if you keep your rate at, say, 100%, which is your levy divided by your tax base equals your rate, and if you keep it from 100% each year, it's going to be flat tax. And that would be true if everybody's value stayed the same every year. But that never happens. So you're always going to have a shift in terms of tax burden. So... If the numerator keeps going up, you're still going to be paying a higher rate. But ultimately, how so in terms of how this is actually calculated, you have town, cities, and schools calculate how much revenue you need. And this is known as your local tax levy. I subtract off the fiscal disparity aid. And then this levy is spread among taxable properties according to their net tax capacity. So this is where I would say A divided by AB equals C. You have the local tax levy divided by your tax capacity equals your local rate. And then there's other credits that might actually affect what your each individual pays, like I said, referendum levies, property tax credits. I won't go into this one, This is, but we can go in if you have specific questions later in terms of how the fiscal disparities programs work. But this is kind of what I was saying with regards to contributing 40% of your growth this is contributed by the commercial businesses within the city of Virginia. It's also paid by public utilities, railroads, uh, anything that's zoned commercial or industrial valuation change, and that goes into that. Um, and there's no distinction between new property and old property with regards to um, changing original tax bases. So it, it's sharing growth in the commercial industrial prop, property tax base between the seven counties. As a whole, St. Louis County is a net winner, meaning we contribute X number of dollars, but we receive, so like last year we contributed, our commercial businesses contributed roughly about $7.8 million into the pool of money, and we got about 15, this, isn't just, this is for all the entities together, got about 15 million. So what that means is we're getting a check from those surrounding counties that are going directly to our tax base. 
again, this is where it's kind of taxing jurisdiction levies versus tax burden. So the tax place, the tax base sharing takes place before I calculate what your rate is. So I'm distributing those funds or subtracting those funds off before I calculate the rate. So as I said, with regards to city of Virginia, your commercial businesses are paying less into the pool than what the city of Virginia and the ISD 2909 and um, the county and those special tax um, they contribute less than what, as a whole, you're, win you're getting more money than if fiscal disparities didn't exist, is ultimately what, how that happens. So this is, what's, this is more of the slide that of, would affect Virginia, where, so if the jurisdiction is a net recipient, which the city of Virginia is, the jurisdiction's taxpayers pay less than the certified levy because they're getting more from the pool than what the businesses in that city would have contributed to the local taxes. So the city of Virginia contrib contributed $528,268 in terms of tax capacity. But we received which but you received a total in terms of one point four six four billion dollars. So in twenty twenty four the city of Virginia is going to be receiving one point eight six million dollars to help offset your levy. But last year you only received one point two five three million. So that's where the other issue, and I know it's a struggle for not just the city of Virginia, but for every taxing authority is you have no control over that. So even if you kept your levy at zero, and all of a sudden you're getting $600,000 less, the taxpayers of the city of Virginia, or the county, or the, what school district, are having to make up that difference. So without you lowering your levy by $600,000, which you're not gonna use, we don't have these numbers until fairly close to when you're setting your budget, not reasonable to try to make an offset right away in terms of, okay, we'll just cut $600,000 from the budget. But this, this is what leads to a lot of questions from cities and towns and schools wondering, we didn't do anything, but yet our taxes are higher. Well, you're getting less money from the pool. And one of the key contributors to that is your local tax rate. So. The problem with fiscal disparities is very much, as kind of like what Brian said, there's a yo-yo effect where your rate goes up, your local tax rate's now 200%. Okay, the next year when I'm calculating that, your rates are high. How the formula works is it's trying to offset that increase so it gives you more money from the pool. So now you're getting 1.8 million versus 1.2. Well, that's great, and if, say, you kept your levy the same at 0%, you're getting an extra $600,000, that's gonna cause your rate to go down. Well then the next year, it's based off of what your previous year's local tax rate was. It says your rate isn't as high now, you're gonna get less money from the pool, which then causes the rate to go back up. This is a common issue with fiscal disparities across the entire state. So with regards to your question earlier in terms of how the rates are, so this is how I, the basics of how I come up with a rate. So I have the levy certified if the levies was 100,000 and the taxable net tax capacity of the city of Virginia was say 350,000. The total city initial tax rate would be 28.571%. What that means is I have to collect 28.57 cents for every dollar of tax capacity in the city of Virginia to meet your $100,000 levy. There's no way for it to generate any more than what you certified to be. Because that's how the rates. Now, there is aid that reduces disparity reduction aid that lowers that rate, but like I said, that's just other funds as well. So your total net tax capacity rate that affects your individual taxes is comprised of the county budget divided by their tax base, the city divided by their tax base, school district divided by their tax base, and any special taxing districts. You add all that together, that's your local tax rate. I take that number and I multiply it by your percentage of your value, your tax capacity. And this is done to every property in St. Louis County. And it, so, yeah. so then the DRA, this was just aid that comes directly from the Department of Revenue. 
Um, that aid cannot lower your tax rate for your individual to be below 90%. So um, there's some areas where if it was, if their, lo their levy divided by their tax base was 92%, it can lower it to 90, but they, if it, they had it even higher, they might've gotten more aid, but that doesn't happen very often. Referendum market value, that's another type of tax primarily done by school districts, but it's the same type of process. You have, they certify a levy to me, I'm dividing it by, typically your referendum market value is gonna be equal to your estimated market value. There is some programs that might change that a little bit, but for the essence of it, it's typically those levies divided by your estimated market value to come up with a rate. And then I take that rate and I multiply it by your estimated market value to come up with how much. That's what usually when you look at your tax statement, it's going to say school school voter approved, those types of things. That's those funds. Okay. Only certain classifications of property pay a referendum market value tax. So seasonal property is exempt from it. Um, rural vacant land is, but commercial industrial tax, homesteads, those types of properties pay that tax capacity tax, referendum market value tax. Here's some of the types of credits and exclusions we have. We have the market value exclusion, agricultural market value exclusion, taconite aid credit. Um, I know that there's discussion, uh, proposal with the state legislature to increase the taconite, the amount of taconite aid that will be, homesteads could possibly be receiving, so that would be good. Disabled veterans exclusion, and there used to be a thing called this old house exclusion as well. Taconite credit is fairly basic, where I calculate what your tax is by multiplying those rates by your valuation, and then I take that total tax and I multiply it by either 57 or 66%. That percentage was dictated long before I was ever involved with property taxes, but certain most areas are 66%, but there is certain areas of the county where it's at 57. So you take that tax divided by that, and the maximum credit you can have is either is two hundred eighty nine dollars and eighty cents in fifty seven percent areas and three hundred and fifteen dollars and ten cents in those areas that are sixty six percent. The other thing that's important to know is that credit doesn't just keep going up. So once you reach that max, any increases in your valuation of your property are going to seem the overall net effect to your tax is going to seem way a lot more higher higher than you're expecting because on the first X number of dollars, you're getting $315 in credit to offset it. As your value increases, you're not getting more homestead credit to help offset it at the same percentage. So as your values keep going up, it's gonna cause your tax, the overall tax rate, or not the rate, but the percentage in tax increase to go up at a higher percentage. Um, if there's a split classification, the entire parcel is eligible for the taconite credit. And if there's, if you have a lot of, say you have a house and three lots in town and you have them all, the assessor has those all linked together as homestead, um, you only get one taconite credit. It doesn't matter if you have four lots or not, you only get one. So that's kind of the basics of what, how this is. There's, like I said, there's so many nuances in terms of different areas, but you have specific questions, I can try to do as best as I can. Uh, thank you, Brendan. I have one question, then we'll go from right to left here to the council. So for the sake of the people who are listening at home, uh, could you uh, just give us a definition of what our mill rate, what, what's the mill rate? The well, mill rate is not exactly a term anymore, unfortunately. What would they call it now? Now it's called a local tax rate. A local so, tax rate, excuse yep, me. Yep, so there, there, but there's multiple rates that affect every classification of property. Like I said, there's a local tax rate, which is based on net tax capacity. You have a referendum market value tax rate. Those are the two that primarily affect homesteads. Um, if you're a commercial business, you're gonna be paying that. You're gonna be paying state general tax. And then if you're in a tax light relief area like the city of Virginia, you're also gonna be paying fiscal disparity tax. But the fiscal disparity tax, like I said, is kind of a alternate where if that didn't exist, you'd be paying more on your other three taxes, um, but you have to add all those three together, or you each one that's treated its own way. But so there used to be historically a thing where it was a mill rate, where you'd have one rate, and your value, multiply it, that was your tax. 
that hasn't existed since before I was in high school. So a long time ago now. So, but that but that still does exist in the United States. So I get a lot of questions for that as well. But okay. So my last question, then I'll move on. How do we lower the local tax rate through the levy? You, right? you, yeah. Thank so you, you either it's if you have A divided by C, B equals C. So if you ever you either reduce your budget and the valuation stay the same, which then will cause your rate to go down, or you attract new business which causes the denominator to go down because now all of a sudden you have another person who's contributing to the pie. But if you keep increasing your pie at the same rate that you're increasing your tax base, you're not going to lower your tax. So one of those things has to occur. Thank you, Brandon. Yep. Appreciate it very much. Uh, Councilor, Ma uh, Councilor Biondich, excuse me. Thank you. Um, just, I just jotted down a few things here. Um, that have affected our town, and I'm not sure how it's affecting our taxes. Okay. Um, number one, it was touched on earlier, the Blue Cross Blue Shield building. We no longer collect taxes on that. What about all the homes that were removed for the public safety building? We lost tax base on that. Count at the tax forfeited properties, we don't collect taxes on those. Commercial buildings that have turned into churches. We don't collect on those. So all of those things are spread out for all of us to pay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Biondich. Uh, Councilor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and another great presentation. In fact, I pulled up the wonderful spreadsheet that you had emailed all of us. Yeah, I saw, that, that, I saw really, that quite spread quite all over the place. But that was a really helpful. Type. Yeah, that was a, a wonderful document um, in order for me to understand somewhat of how you guys, you know, how that all works together. Um, so part of my, I got a couple questions. So on the, um, on the $413,000 and above, there's no homestead exclusion um, above that figure. What happens when the EMVs keep increasing? And at some point, I mean, they might be bypassing that number. Why is that a cap, and can that be addressed? So that's what it, they are addressing that at the state. So that for taxes payable in 2025, they increased the cap. And so now, instead of it maxing out at 76000 they upped it to 95000 that just has to be decided at the state legislature. That's completely so that's just by statute. That would be worked yep. at, at the legislature. Yep. So, so they increased it, but like you said, if values continue to keep going higher and higher and higher, they're you know I'm sure that's what's reacting now because of what's happened with valuation increases right. over the last four years. There was a big draw for legislatures to sort of call for them to say, hey. How many seventy? How many seventy-six thousand dollars houses do we have? Because it's not just us; it's also across the whole state. It's the same regardless if it's St. Louis County or Hennepin County. It's still that cap. Okay, thanks for addressing that. And then, when someone applies any of these exclusions, the homestead exclusions, does the does that um, dollar amount that they're saving get spread around the rest of the? Yep. Yeah. So if. Your house was valued at a hundred, or say, we'll just say seventy-six thousand dollars. Your maximum exclusion is thirty thousand four hundred, so you're paying taxes as if it was forty-five thousand dollars. Okay, um, so yeah, that lowers the denominator. That lowers your tax base. If all of a sudden you don't have that exclusion, your property now is contributing an extra thirty thousand dollars to the tax base. So when they in two thousand and twelve. When they went from homestead property, to, or they used to have a tax or a <coughs> homestead credit that would show up on your taxes, and that tax credit was funded from the state, they got rid of that and they introduced market value exclusion, which ultimately shifted the burden of that to the local taxing jurisdictions. When they did that, that caused local tax rates to go up fairly significantly across most of the areas of St. Louis County, especially those areas that had lower value homes because you're getting the maximum amount of exclusion. So the tax base for those areas dropped down significantly, causing rates to go way up. And in order to uh, receive that exclusion, a homeowner would need to apply for it. Is that correct? They have to apply to be with the assessor's office to be classified as, home, as homestead. 
have to they, don't, there's, they don't have to apply for the exclusion itself. It just the property has to be classified as homestead to receive. So they have it. to opt in to actually being a part of the process. Yep. Okay. And then, um, so I just want to address, if I may, really quick, um, the discussion on the TIF since we just did another TIF in our um, area here. The question that I have is the TIF that we just did was for a five hundred thousand dollar value. Now, once the build out happens at the location and that build out is a significant amount, say eight million. Okay, so eight million. Now the TIF is offset <coughs> by the five the five hundred thousand dollars, the TIF tax increment financing it on five hundred thousand dollars. But once that build out that entity will be paying taxes, property taxes, based on the new valuation the year after it is built and reevaluated. Is that correct? Yeah. What ends up happening is that if, say, your value was at 500000 when it started, the city of Virginia County School are still going to be receiving funds based on that $500,000 valuation. If all of a sudden the value goes up to $8 million, that seven point five million dollars is the difference. Yep, it now pays what's called tax increment financing tax or uh, financing. That's recognized. Tax. It's recognized. The collection is recognized on the difference. The it, TIF is only based on the the actual growth, allocation. The growth. The, the, right. Yep. So, but so your levy is not being offset or being funded by that seven point five million dollar increase. Got it. Because typically what ends up happening, and I'm not a complete expert in TIF, in the fact of it's mainly for you know uh, promoting growth. Growth. Because whether the district seven years or 25 years, it's, and that's kind of a, a reason for TIF is it's the but for test for tax increment okay. financing. So if you don't do the TIF district, would that growth have occurred? So, so once the city of Virginia sees the recognition of that property tax, that will also be spread yep. uh, to lower the rest of the EMV or the rest of the tax on the, the entire city. So, so when, the, when the tax increment financing district comes to an end, because there's a year for different whatever, you all, the, those jurisdictions, the city, the school, the special taxing districts, the county, will be benefiting from that full value. So... If you don't, if you weren't going to get that eight million dollars without the eight mil, without the TIF district, then your tax base wouldn't be. That's the long term goal of TIF. That's the purpose of TIF yep. ultimately. So, a quick clarification, if I may, and I don't mean to go on. Does the city of Virginia though collect the tax? I know, like, say it's a twenty year TIF, we wouldn't collect till year twenty one. Um, but I thought that was on the five hundred. Thousand that we basically the TIF is for. So if they do the eight million dollars of con new construction, are we then recognizing that as property tax amount? Not as part of your levy, but we send you the cities and the jurisdictions okay. that have that the funds, and then they just do the actual distributions based okay. on the requirements from okay. the TIF district. So from our overall conversation, I think what I'm what I'm hearing, and I'm trying to answer my own question about. What can Virginia do? What can we do to lower taxes? And it sounds like what we need to do is we need to recruit commercial and industrial business growth. Um, that would be something that would be very helpful to offset or bring lower the tax uh, amount. Then we need to, it sounds like, reduce our overall budget, which would decrease our levy. So we need to focus on reducing the overall budget going forward. Um, and then I had no new TIFs, kind of maybe as a suggestion, no new TIFs, because that basically doesn't, it's not recognized unless it's a, a very significant Im impact economically. We did one with the hotel. We'll be recognizing the 13% hospitality tax for the, the Tourism Bureau, which I think makes sense. But in going forward, a TIF basically does exactly kind of like what you're saying um, Councillor Biondich, that you pull that off the tax base, and that's not necessarily a positive. Yep, the, ta the tax growth is taken off your tax base. Correct. Yes. Yep. So it's not necessarily a positive until the year twenty one. If it's yeah, a until year tip. typically, yeah, it could be, not be a positive. So, like yep. for me to have a roadmap or a guide, I would say recruit commercial industrial business, reduce our budget. 
to decrease the levy and no new TIFs. Yep. So That's that would correct. be a roadmap that I would say to follow. And I appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Before I go to Councilor uh, Freely, we've been patiently waiting. Chair, did you have a comment or a question yeah, or a clarification? Um, and I just, um, I think you, it was, you, you got the understanding of it. What is the average TIF life of a district is probably 10 to 15 years? Yeah, it just depends on if it's a redevelopment district or a hazard. Um, Duluth has a lot that are 25. Uh, many of the, the city of Duluth is by far the one that has the most TIF districts. Um, they have a lot that are 25. Um, otherwise, it's 9 to 15, yeah. typically. So in a nutshell, the taxes that are collected on that go right back to the business owner or the development. Yeah, because that's what they're saying is for the development. They're saying the developer, if you if I don't receive those tax monies or those TIF monies, I'm not going to do the development in your area. And so that where it ends up being up to the local jurisdictions to decide whether it makes sense to them for that property to be in a TIF district or not. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Councilor Freely. Thank you. Mary, Brian, Brandon, thank you very much. This has been the most detailed, thorough, and truly educational presentation on the assessment process that I've ever sat through, and I do appreciate that. And yet, in the two hours plus that we've been sitting here, Five words continue to go through my mind. It is what it is. That's the reality from the perspective of what I've heard. You guys are tied to regulations, requirements, and it is what it is. And so the relief that I would look for to assist people that are burdened by this, like Sarah and Brandon and Carrie and Greg and myself and all of us sitting here that live in the city of Virginia, seems as though the entire and absolute and exclusive onus is on all of us right here. It really is. And the suggestions you've made are those that we have to address. And, but I do want to say that that's why we are elected officials, because we have to make those decisions. And we are the ones that have to prioritize how that money needs to be spent uh, there was some claim that there was mismanagement on the part of the city that held up negotiations and so on, which I found somewhat troubling because the reality is when we're making decisions that are very difficult and need to be prioritized in terms of what fiscal resources we have, which are very limited, if we make a decision that doesn't fit the perspective of somebody in the audience, that means that was mismanaged decision making. I don't agree with that. And, you know, we have $15 million projects that are needing to be done in the city um, and, and, and other projects that need to be done. Look at above us right here. I mean, this is an indication of like where we sit even in the city itself. So I want to, I need to, and I'm going to be making every effort to help make decisions that will assist in alleviating the pressures that people feel in the taxes in this city because I don't want to lose residents like Brandon or Carrie or Sarah or Greg or anybody. We don't want to lose them. But the reality is, from what I heard today, there's nothing these people can do. And we can no longer turn to them and say, well, they're skewing the assessments and they're over-evaluating so and so and so forth. That's just not the case anymore. I've come to realize that. I was educated today that what decisions need to be made are us right here. And it's going to be difficult and will continue to be difficult, but it's what we need to do and gear for. So I thank you for that information and for putting the burden back on my shoulders exclusively. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Freely. But Councilor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two questions. Um, you had talked about development. Are we also talking about apartment buildings, multifamily use, that kind of stuff? Would that type of development help Any, with the tax? Yeah, anything to add to your tax base will help, whether okay. it's commercial business, if you had an area that you do you know, for housing development. I mean, that's a popular thing. That's cars in Duluth all the time, whether it's condos. And you're adding more people to help contribute to your pie. That the big thing with it is if you want to have your tax rate go down, you can't increase your levy at the same rate that you're increasing your tax base because otherwise your rate's just going to stay flat. And then 
if the rate stays flat, yeah, your taxes will possibly stay the same. But usually when that, what happens with that is if you have new construction and those types of things, those usually affect sales, I would think, with regards to if they're newer value homes and they're selling for higher valuations, that's going to cause values to go up as well. So, But yeah, any, any type of growth you can attract will help because you're just adding, help, having more people help contribute to your pie. Your My other question, can you explain the dark store and how major box stores are taxed at a very low rate as opposed to a useful rate for cities? Well, it's all commercial, all commercial property in terms of for the actual how I calculate the tax is the same. So if, if it's classified as commercial and it's a downtown business and it's classified as commercial, they're paying at the exact same class rate as Walmart. Okay? So... How they come up with the valuation of the five million dollars or whatever the heck you know the, the valuation would be, I'm not really familiar with. But okay, thank you. Yeah, it's it's the tax itself. They're paying the exact same taxes at the same tax rates. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, Brandon. Uh, okay, um, do you have one more question there, Councillor Paulson? Councillor Paulson. Mayor, I just have one more question regarding the the fiscal disparities. So I want to just understand this as we go forward with planning 2025 budget. So that yo-yo, it will happen. So it really, it you can't really bank on that. Even if you zeroed out your levy, you still have other factors that contribute to that uh, fiscal disparity. And we're too far into our budget process in order to even, maybe even have a conversation about what that might look like. Yeah, well, that, and that happens every year depending on the area. Yeah. I mean, especially if you, if you kept your levy flat or within 1% or what, I'm just using a rough number, but keep fairly flat every year, that yo-yo would stop to going up and down so much. So what what ends up be consistent. What ends up happening is when that growth occurs and then, oh, okay, we have 10% growth in our tax base, we're going to raise our tax levy by 14%. Okay, well, now it still causes your rate to go up. So then when your rate goes up, you're going to get more money from the pool next year, probably, which will then, if you kept it at zero, it's going to cause it to go down. So you have to keep it. The areas that don't see major fluctuations in terms of the amount of funding they get are ones where their levies are typically flat. So mainly townships. It's very rare that townships really drastically change their levies. So they're usually consistent in terms of how much funding they're getting versus cities, which you know changes year to year. Okay, and um, I had one other thing on top of that. Left my brain, so I will let it go. Oh, Thank fine. you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Okay, so we're circling the wagons here, so. Uh, I would like anybody from the audience to be able to ask a question before we, we wrap this up, but first we'll go to Councillor Motley. If you had your light on, Councillor Motley. Brandon, I'm going to put you on the spot. That's fine. It's going to be worse than Brian. That's okay. Hey, you see the numbers. You've been doing this, what, 18 years? Yep. I heard you correctly. Does the city of Virginia have a spending problem? I can't comment directly from a, uh, uh, a, uh, that type of categorical comment. I, it's ultimately, in order to have your rate go down, you, you have to have your, the tax base in order to support what your budget is. Right. And that's true of any organization, whether it's Virginia, the county, the school district, is you have to have the value and the tax base and the residents there in order to satisfy how much money you need. And that's why you're all elected. And I'm not. <laughs> Because you have to make those choices in terms of where you're going to allocate those funds. All I'm doing is I'm a glorified mathematician taking the numbers that people give me to say this is how it should be spread. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Brandon. Mary? Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Um, Councillor Paulson had made the comment earlier about TIFs, and I just wanted to share um, from my experience they can be a very valuable tool. 
that can be used. That increment, you know, it sounds like there's quite a bit of construction maybe planned for one of your TIFs. You know, that increment can be used to encourage development in the future. Um, and of course, that but for test, will they come unless, you know, and sometimes it's like, well, they're already here. <laughs> so um, it can be a good tool. But, you know, you know, what's the long term impact? You kind of have to wait things out and you can use that increment to encourage. Um, so, you know, closing or not, you know, long term impact. But before we close, I also wanted to um, say thank you so much for all of this time to present this material with you. Um, we really do, and I maybe I'm speaking for these two, but we enjoy the opportunity because we do get a lot of questions and there's um, uncertainty about the process, but our team does a wonderful job and they're here to help. Um, and we do make changes. We do drop things if there's there's errors. So again, thank you so much for your time. And if there's any follow-up questions, certainly feel free to email me or Brian and we or Brandon and we can follow up with you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, before we close, uh, and I have a couple of final comments, uh, does anybody from the audience have a question or comment they'd like to uh, address at this point in time? Uh, Mr. Grahek has um, uh, some cards in the back. Uh, and, of course, you can certainly contact him if you have any other further questions. I certainly have a list of them I'll be asking for some clarification. So thank you very much. First, I want to apologize to the county because, you know, I oversimplify some of the statements I made at previous council meetings about, you know, as, as if you raise the value of the, uh, of the properties, your taxes go up. Well, to some degree, that's true, as we had the conversation with Rec, but there's, it's a completely different model on how we address and how we set our budget and how our tax rate is and all those kind of things moving forward and all those moving forward you all talked about today. So as as I think Councilor, all the councilors and particularly Councilor Freely, the burden is on the city council and elected body and the staff to try to find a way in which to minimize as much as we can uh, the, the residential property taxes, the increases in that based upon a variety of factors, the commercial property, investitive, all those kind of things are factors. So on behalf of the city of Virginia and myself personally, Thanks for coming in. It was very educational for me as well. So Mary, Brandon, Brian, thank you so very much for coming in. It's been uh, a very educational. Uh, uh, so anybody in the audience who is listening at home, that opportunity uh, is available to you. And uh, if there's any credits available to you, certainly give the county a call and they can tell you what options are available for you. So like once again, uh, anybody else have any questions, comments before we close? Are uh, this a part of the presentation? Seeing none, thank you so very much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Okay, I know that uh, 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 Matt has been waiting a long time, and we appreciate that. So my question is, is, is Matt on, uh, on item two and, 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 and item four too? Item two, three, four, and five. <laughs> Two, three, four, and five. So, for just for may we take a five minute break before we move on to the next item? Let's do that. Let's take a few minutes. Got to go.
It was interesting. Well, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was calling Sue. She's like, are you preposterous? She's got the same thing going on. Oh, no. I know. I don't ever get those liquid ones. Oh, I am. Well, I'm glad I saw you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're back from a little break uh, uh, after that presentation from the county. Once again, I want to thank the county for coming up and, and uh, laying us a, a really comprehensive presentation on how this uh, the Texas property tax system works. So uh, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda. 
Oh, Britt. Thank you. Next item on agenda is Matt Reed, our engineer of record from SCH, regarding the first one is material testing quote for Northeast Technical Services for 6th Avenue North and 17th Street South project at the cost of $19,856. Good morning. I just wanted to make sure it was still morning. Yeah. So. We don't want to mad at him. I, I owe you lunch. No, it's all good. It, I got an education too. Most of that stuff, I'll be honest, goes right over my head. But I picked up bits and pieces that I didn't know. So it's all good. And it's certainly good for you guys. To, it seemed like you guys got a lot out of it. So that was good. I'm glad that it worked out. Um, so number 2A, the, the first two items actually are very similar. So as you know, we've got these two projects starting up here in a couple of weeks. We actually have pre-construction meeting for 10th and 13th Street project tomorrow. And then the one for 6th and 17th is actually next week. So we're hearing possibly the end of April, which is kind of strange for this part of the country <laughs> to have construction going that soon. But uh, the two items on the agenda, starting with A, is the materials testing quote from NTS. And that is to get, have the compaction test done, uh, those types of things to ensure that the roadbed is ready and when the contractor's done. So I can answer any questions. That's really what A and B are both, just for the different projects. There's certainly a much more intensive effort required on the 10th and 13th project due to the federal funding that's involved. They have a little more strict requirements. So that's why that quote is quite a bit higher. But I can answer any questions you might have on those. Okay, thank you. Make a motion on the approval of uh, the materials testing quote for $19,856 and with further discussion, hopefully. Okay, uh, Support. motion by Councillor Freely, supported by Councillor um, uh, Paulson regarding item 2A, approve the materials testing quote for Northeast Technical Services for 6th Avenue, North and 17th Street South at a cost of $19,856. It's been moved and supported. Further discussion? Councilor Freelieb. So in looking at that and thinking about this, like, and not to put the responsibility on anybody like NTS exclusively, but like when you're talking about a project of this significance and they're going to be doing this analysis of materials and so on, could this not then minimize the possibilities of change orders in the future, having knowledge of what's down there that they're going to have to, it, that's what I'm thinking. Like, is this the time now? And are these the people that can assist us in making those determinations ahead of time so that like when Wasabi Bituminous comes in, oh, we got to do this now. Could it have been captured in this or no? Probably not. The, the, the materials testing part really comes into it. It's, it's on the contractor to ensure that they meet, meet the specified requirements that are in the bidding documents or in the project uh, construction documents. What this is, is to ensure that those are met. It does help the contractor, certainly, uh, but it, it is really to, from the city's perspective, to ensure that you're getting the product that, it's sort of like having us out on site during the project, watching what's going on. It's to ensure that you're getting the product that you are paying for. As far as for the future, that information should be much better documented than it was in the past. We've got record drawings, we've got the soil boring information that we have. So all of that information that will come out of this project will be in the city file somewhere. So 20 years from now, if they decide to go redo that road again, that information should be available. The, the record keeping today is much better than it was 50 years ago, for example. So. Thank you. Uh, moved and supported. 2A, further discussion. Councilor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make sure, Matt, this is part um, included in the overall budget that we had assumed. It is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councilor Paulson. Uh, any further discussion? Moved and supported. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, same with item uh, 2B. Moved to approve by Councilor Freely. Is there support? Support. By Councilor Motley, is there any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And the next item is approved seeking bids for the 2024 storm sewer rehab project. Okay, so this project has been on the table for a couple of years, actually. We did apply for, uh, C, uh, through the county, CDBG funding and it is our. It actually was a, 
applied for and I think we got it in 22, if I'm not mistaken. And we ended up extending it because once again, we were dealing with some easement issues and some timing on that. We got that, finally, we were able to get that all squared away. So it is there. It, what it entails is reconstructing the storm sewer main from just south of the new public safety building site. So it would actually tie in to the storm sewer that's being constructed on the public safety building site. And then it goes down south towards Highway 53 and ultimately discharges into the ditch and, and down through the rest of the city system. It is actually one of the city's main trunk, main, trunk storm sewer mains for that part of town that as Jim, yeah, Jim's still here, Jim could attest to, it's been repaired numerous times. It's supposed to be this big to carry water. In many places, it's this big because they've had to slide pipe inside a pipe to make it work. I don't know if you guys remember back, uh, we were just talking about a Councilor Friedlieb and Jim and I, probably 10 years ago, there was a collapse on 10th Street South where, I, not, if I'm not mistaken, a vehicle actually ended up getting stuck in it, that's this storm sewer line. So from a capacity standpoint, and of course now we're gonna have all that new pipe uh, on, this, on the uh, public safety building site, that was the um, genesis of, of why this project became uh, a priority for the city. So we're just now coming forward with, the timing is actually really good because they're gonna start doing the storm sewer construction on the public safety building site soon hopefully we're hearing probably in may and, or, or june and so what we're looking at today is is just asking the council to, for permission to seek bids and uh, we would get those and probably get them back here sometime middle to end of may for you to review so i can answer any questions on that that you might have thank you uh, Councilor johnson is this the sewer that um, terminate the pipes terminate at the uh, youth foyer mm -hmm. is that where it is okay. yep I will move this project forward to get the bids uh, Councilor Johnson move to approve uh, going out for bids is there support I'll support with comment A support by Councilor Freely with further comment comment Councilor Freely me. you know just the first three things that we're talking about here when they say oh we have a spending problem in Virginia Minnesota we have a needs problem. There are all kinds of needs that need to be addressed in this city that cost tens and thousands and millions of dollars. So we're doing our best, and we're going to even do better. We have to. So in any event, I, I want people to recognize the fact that we just spent $50,000 on the first part, and this is going to be another $600,000. We have to make decisions to spend money because we need to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Freelieb. It has been moved and supported. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Councillor uh, Biondich and then over to Councillor Paulson. Councillor Biondich. Thank you, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, it is what it is, but I will ask again, what pot of money does this come out of? Is it part of a project? Was this set aside for anything, or where will the funds come from? Correct me if I'm wrong here, Matt and Britt, but this is mail the 224 Street Bond, correct? Yeah, we do have 137,000, I think, was in grant from CDBG. So the remainder of it would be included with the bond that you're doing. I think that's the plan right now, right, Britt? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, answer your question, Councilor Biondich. Okay, uh, Councilor Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. So we're, we'd be bonding of $480,000 additionally? It's, it is part of the number four. <laughs> Down to number four on your packet today. It's part of that discussion. Yes. Okay, I don't know that I would feel comfortable moving this That's, forward. It's not levied. This is a storm sewer, so it's utility user fee generated. And what Matt's going to do is get bids right now so we know the actual cost of the project. Right now, he's guessing what we have as an estimate Matt provided to us. We don't know if that's really what the cost is or not. Could be less, could be more, could be, we don't know what it is. We're just approving the seek bids. We're just approving seek bids so we can know what's spending any amount. money. Correct. Yeah, I understand that. I just um, wanted to clarify before I say yes to something. If we're discussing the actual financial portion of it on, under item number four, so um, not that I'm opposed to it. I just think 
a financial discussion should probably be had prior to voting yes. Anyway, um, my question actually was, as this moves south, where does that end up, Matt? You said Highway uh, 53. Does that go through that little sliver of property that is owned by the state of Minnesota? It goes down on the, it's on the north side of Highway 53, and then it goes down into the ditches, and and then the Jim's guys have been doing a whole bunch of clearing and cleaning up of those ditches. Yeah, and, there's, there's so. a cross culvert uh, that runs under 53, just uh, east of the ball field entrance road. It, uh, it's not that corner property that's abandoned by the state in the between Second Avenue and Highway 53. Yes, it doesn't affect that. Right no. Right. So it's west of that. It's not does not include the little sliver of property that the state of Minnesota owns. That would be on the south west corner. Oh, yeah, right. No. Okay. So it does run behind that. And, okay. And okay. And is there a current storm stormwater system on that little sliver of? property that the state owns. I'm just thinking for future development, what does that look like? And if we're doing something. I have to look. There could be a tie-in. Okay, that's, I was just wondering where that was running and if it could be incorporated cost-wise with the state, but there can be a tie-in if there's some sort of development that would come forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Paulson. Has been moved and supported. Is there any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Item number three is a draft ordinance regarding uh, monument markers, survey markers, and replacement if they are removed. This happened on our Third Avenue project. The contractors removed the monuments that are replaced in the road, and we didn't realize until we were getting a survey of a property near there that the monuments were not there. So we, Matt and I discussed we need some kind of something, a policy or an ordinance to dictate what happens when those monuments are moved. So we created a draft ordinance for your review to look at about how to... Um, Address that if that were to happen again. Councilor Paulson. Thank you. Could you explain? I read through this, but could you just explain it like a little better? And then I have been discussing when we're doing these large projects and the contractors come in, and the same thing with the roadways. I was wondering if that ad could at all be tied in with this, but I don't, it's an, that's, this is an ordinance. I don't know what we would be talking about regarding tying roadways in, but it's basically, if you move something, put it back and make it sure it's the same way it was when you left it. Is that what this basically is saying? Correct. Correct. And Matt, do you have anything else you want to add? I can give you a quick explanation. So the, what they're saying is, if somebody, and it wouldn't even have to be one of the city's contractors, it could be a, a private utility company or somebody comes in and digs in and they disturb a property corner or a survey monument that happens to be out there, that they are responsible for replacing it, all costs replacing it. If they come, sometimes they come across them and they see them, in which case then according to that information, they're supposed to report it to us, tell us how they're going to remedy it. They're going to pull it out, then they're going to replace it. Sometimes they don't see it. And it, it's just something that, that they dig through, they hit, they didn't realize was there. And after they hit it, sometimes they see it, in which case then they're supposed to report it to us. And sometimes they don't. But it gives the city the opportunity that if, let's say, like in this situation that, we, that Britt was referring to, after the fact, we realized that something had gotten disturbed as part of a project. The city's got some teeth behind something to go back to a contractor and say, hey, you guys need to figure out a way to get this replaced. And either, in other words, get a surveyor to come out here and replace it. So that's really what the, the gist of, of this particular ordinance is. It's related to survey monuments and property corners. It does not necessarily refer to the sod in somebody's yard. Or if, I think that's what you're getting at, right? Um, no, I'm actually getting at a city street, city oh, Virginia. City we have street. that in place already. 
we actually have a utility permit, right, Britt? There's, we did that a couple of years ago. There is a permit that contractors are supposed to come and get when they're digging in city right of way that requires them to put it back to the condition that it was previously. So on the one way, what is that, 2nd Avenue? Avenue South? 2nd Street. Yep. 2nd and 5th. 2nd second, second Street, excuse me, and between 5th and 6th. That's completely obliterated. Oh, because of the school? So how do we, that's what I want. I've been talking about this now since we've had to, VEDA had to pay to repave Progress Parkway mm -hmm. because all the heavy equipment trucks were basically destroyed the road system there. So do we have anything on the books that would go back to and say, hey, you've got to put it in the same condition it was when you left it? Because now what's going to happen is residents are going to be assessed I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know what the agreements were between the city and the school district at the time for utilizing the roads and in, in that area. I don't recall. Same thing's going to happen on second when we do the public safety between tenth and twelfth or tenth and eighth. Second's a pretty heavy duty road that should hold up. It's a lot newer road. That's a ten ton designed road. Second Street is not. <laughs> so Second Street needs to be needed to be repaired even before it was. And I don't done, mean to so. segue. I'm just asking if that needs to be. I mean, this is an actual ordinance. I don't know if you can add that type of. Maybe Brian, you can answer that. If if your road, I mean, that's a property of the city of Virginia, and if they disturb the property and it's, it needs to go back to what it was. If I may. Yes, Brian. Uh, Councilor, I think the answer to that question, I think the city could put something on the books. I'm not sure tying it into this specific section is the, is the appropriate, the most appropriate place to put it. What this, uh, what this ordinance does, this change, it actually dovetails really nicely with uh, some state statutes that are out there about uh, it actually can become a criminal offense to move uh, placed uh, markers and things like that. This actually creates a better system within the city to practically replace those things as opposed to trying to get, number one, trying to get somebody criminally charged, and then number two, trying to seek some restitution award to relocate it. This is uh, a much better, cleaner system for the city. As it relates the the damage that can sometimes accompany uh, construction, <clears throat> There, there are certain legal theories out there, you know, tort theories and destruction of property type things where there could be some recovery already, but creating a separate ordinance to address it specifically or to put a system in place for notification and communication with the city about these projects and, and what type of effect it may have on the roads may be a good system. Okay, thank you. And I guess with that, I would, I would be fine with it the way it is, but I'd like to have that further discussion. Thank you, Mayor. Well, thank you, Councilor Paulson. Do we have a motion to support for that yet? Okay, looking for council action. Councilor uh, Freely moves to approve uh, the draft ordinance as... Uh, as uh, uh, actually, no, that's not, I was asking for further... Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, there's had been no motion on the floor with respect to this draft ordinance. Uh, further comments before a motion is made, Councilor Freely... Is that okay with it? That sure, certainly, question? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, I'm not a fan of ordinances, and particularly the most recent ones that we put in place that have handcuffed people from being able to accomplish things. And so I'm just wondering, like, it seems to me that this is more of a communications breakdown. Could we not communicate that through, like, the permitting process so that when people are going to be potentially uh, upending these things or unearthing these things that that within that permitting process it could be communicated that these are the consequences for doing that or the expectations for getting it back to where it was originally as opposed to an enforcement type of ordinance to like potentially charge somebody for doing something that's I'm a little I think that's a little heavy-handed but that's just my own personally perspective that I needed to convey that's all so that's what I'm saying is like, I think there's another way to do it, but if this is what you think is the best way to do it and what you're recommending from the legal aspect, then I'm not going to you know, debate that further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Freely. Okay. Uh, so I have a quick question. So uh, this marker statute. So say uh, in the course of a project, uh, unbeknownst to the, uh, we unearth a, a marker or a monument or something that, requires uh, further investigation. 
say, for example, a Native American artifact or something that's located there, or they find some unidentified bones or something from years ago, there's a state statute of requirements that the, the, the cease and desist any construction until that's further investigated. Is that correct? All right, thank you. Councilor Biondich. Is there an instance that has arisen that prompted this? Yes. So the markers were, that I'm referencing on this reference in this ordinance is the markers that, you know, you've heard of northwest corner of this northeast corner of the, we had one in middle of 3rd Avenue that during that construction project got removed and didn't get put back. And so the question came to the contractor whose responsibility is to put it back, the city's or his, because we didn't specify yet to put it back. And I didn't even know it was there personally, to tell you the truth. And thankfully, we got it put back. But then Matt said, you know, really, if this ever were to happen again, we should have some kind of thing, ordinance in place, that, or policy that states what to do when that happens, or how we're always going to address it, so that we always know clearly whose responsibility is to put it back. In the private sector, in houses, what we hear a lot, what we used to hear a lot, um, people will be putting in a fence or a tree, and they accidentally hit their neighbor's survey pin, and they pull it out <laughs> and don't put it back. Who's responsible then? I paid good money for that survey, $1,000, and my neighbor just pulled it out, and we had nothing. We would just tell them it's not our responsibility. Now at least we have something in the books. We can tell them it is a violation of city ordinance. You've got to put it back. So the consequence isn't a big deal. It is just to have something on Clearly to find who is responsible for it. With I mean, that, we do I know it's very clearly mapped where the section corners are for all these, you know, the sections in town, section 58 north and such. But the survey pins aren't clearly marked. And some people have pounded them down very low in the ground. Some have left them up. And if you're digging around and you hit your neighbor's survey pin, I mean, it's really on your own is to put it back. But this at least gives us the ability to say, you, yes, you have to put it back. With that, I will make the motion. Uh, Councilor... Uh, Beyondish makes a motion to uh, approve the draft ordinance uh, to be moved to the city council for a final uh, uh, decision. Uh, is there support? Support. By Councilor uh, Johnson. Is there further discussion, Councilor Johnson? Thank you, Mayor. And I, I think that this only becomes a problem when it's a problem. You know, you don't have to mess around with your yard. Um, for instance, I know that on 8th Street, when they redid 8th Street, a lot of those pins disappeared in people who had had their yard survey. And it is, you have to get another thousand dollar survey to find your pins so you can be in um, compliance with the rest of our stuff so I think this is a good idea and I think it's it's timely um, as we're moving forward especially with some of the other street projects going on thank you uh, thank you Councilor Johnson has been moved and supported to move this to the City Council for final determination is there support uh, for further discussion there's no further discussion all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call, please. I got a little confused when you raised your hand there to support which it was already supported, so thank you. I'll call, I'll roll call, please. Yes. Friedlieb? Not opposed to the concept of what we're trying to accomplish, but the ordinance, I think, is not necessary, so no. Thank you. Paulson? Yes. Yandich? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Terenzelli? Yes. Coffee? Aye. Uh, motion passes 6-1. Thank you. Next item. The next item is the review of the resolution regarding the issuance of general obligation bonds, series 2024A. And this, they will, we will have Mia Thibodeau from Freiburger and um, George Eilertson from North and Securities at our council meeting next week to discuss this as well. Hey, thank you. I will move the resolution. Council Johnson moves to approve the resolution, moving it forward to the city council meeting for additional discussion presentation by Northern Securities and uh, Freiburger. Is there support? Support by Councilor Barnzelli. Is there any further discussion? Councilor Paulson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So were we planning on, this was already in our plans. Yes. And then we're adding on uh, item under item two C on top of the on top of this 
dollar value in the bond issuance. Correct. We were going to do it last year. Like Matt said, we applied for this in 2022. We had permission from the council to go to CDBG to apply for this, knowing that, if you remember Jim calling it the tin whistle, this is the tin whistle project, that knowing that the capacity from our public safety center site, the water flow that's going to be coming down is going to shoot out underneath the 2nd Avenue, underneath um, uh, um, short stop, out to that ditch, and we needed to correct it. We were hoping to do it last year, so we were going to put it in last year's bond, but we didn't have the easements ready. So we got the easements. We weren't expecting them. They came in two weeks ago, surprisingly. We weren't expecting them that fast. And so timely, like Matt said, now we can add it to the 2024 bond rather than having to issue a separate bond for that project. So this would tie, it would tie into this existing bond. Correct. Um, and it will be explained at the following meeting. Correct. This is not a levy. This is this portion is not levied. This portion is used by storm sewer fees. And it will will there be any assessments residentially? Not on the storm sewer portion. On the street project portion, there will be. We've okay. had those hearings recently. Again. So it's kind of the chicken and the egg. I mean, I don't want to spend the money, but we need to improve what we need to improve. Um is there any funding that comes with this at all? Yes, we did get CDBG money for this. But we, that was only 137000 for that one. As soon one. as we get the bids back, I can apply for IRRR money, but I can't apply for it until we get the bids back. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. But I should take it back. I have the pre-app in. I can't finish the application until I get the bids back. Uh, thank you, Councilor Paulson. It has been moved and supported. Is there any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And then the next item is it going to the same discussion is the updating the ordinance for the storm sewer fee. Our storm sewer fee is set at $6 a year right now. And with these projects that we are completing, it's not enough to pay the bond payment for that $6 a year residential. Um, so we, I don't have an idea at this moment, George, I also will be coming to talk to you more. I just wanted to get this on your radar. That's something we need to talk about, um, either modifying the ordinance, changing the ordinance, or I don't know how we want to do this quite yet. But I just want to get on your radar for something for you to consider going forward. Okay, thank you. Mr. Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, don't, I don't think the full ordinance is... It is. Um, shouldn't we... Not should we not remove fees that are attached to an ordinance? Have the ordinance remain and then make the fees by a resolution? Like, yep, so the resolution is on page 42, yep. and the ordinance of how it's applied is on page 39. Okay, so yeah. so we're pulling it out and doing and it's it the kind right of way. a discussion. Do we have that discussion? It's it's confusing how it's applied in the ordinance. So it's just, just kind of the discussion I want to bring up to you guys is maybe we should talk about changing the ordinance totally and then changing the fee or something going forward. Okay. This really was just for information today, just to get on your radar to start thinking about. Thank you. We might need to change a little bit. And it was well for further discussion. Just yeah. put on our radar as, as uh, radar. discussions yes. moving forward. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about item five? I think that's all we have for Matt-related items. Thank you, Matt, for painting. Matt, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Item number six was to discuss the city entry in the 2024 Land of the Loom Parade. Okay. Councilor Johnson, did you have? Uh... Is this the city in general or council or the loon or what? Uh, in the council. Both. Well, I will move that we allow the loon in freight as always, and then it'd be up to individuals if they were to walk or not. Hey, thank you. Um, moved by Councillor Johnson is our support. Support by Councillor Freely. Further discussion? I just want to lay it on the radar. I kind of got... Uh, for the lack of a better term, chastised by one of the event coordinators when the city of Virginia loon was was one entry and the city council and the mayor was the other entry. And by combining the two, it created a problem uh, with the schedule moving forward. So maybe we should clarify if it's going to be we're going to be together or separately when we fill out this thing for the land of loon parade. So that's all I would have to say. And uh, on another note, I won't be available that day. I have a special uh um, honor guard ceremony at nine o'clock that morning 
on Saturday, so I won't be there. So, but it has been moved. It has been supported, and moved and supported to uh, um, participate in the Land and Loon Parade. Is there any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Number seven. Number seven was a request from Councilor Johnson that the city draft a letter of support for the junior hockey team to locate in the city of Eveleth. Hey, thank you. Uh, Councilor Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. I, I know that we were unable to facilitate a similar request, but I think allowing and supporting the city of Eveleth um, to move forward and by sending a letter, it says that we understand the importance of um, what the economic impact is not only to the city of Eveleth but for all the surrounding communities. So I would make a motion that we direct staff to um, write a letter of support um, in reference to the junior hockey team moving into Eveleth. Uh, moved by Councilor Johnson. Is there support? Support. By Councilor Motley. Further discussion? Just one quick clarification, if I may, Councilor Johnson. Is this a request that's coming from us or did Eveleth ask us for this letter? Uh, this was my, I had this uh, independent thought thinking, you know, if we're going to start crossing bridges, this would be a perfect opportunity to show regional support. Yeah, I would, I would assume that based upon that, uh, there would be no opposition on the part of Eveleth if we, if we uh, uh, send them a letter of support. So thank you. It has been moved and supported. Is there any further discussion? A hearing and seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And the final item I have today, Mayor, is contract negotiations regarding me. Hey, before we go into, can I put under one other item of concern? Uh, if I could have staff uh, uh, make an in, uh, inquiry, if it's uh, amenable to the council. Uh, there's that street that's uh, right across from Stifle Nichols. It's been a one-way street for I don't know how long. Uh, could we just take a look at that to see if that can be converted into a two-way street or if there's a reason why it can't be? Thank you. Okay, uh, that's all I have. Uh, anybody else have any other items of concern before we enter into closed session? Seeing none, looking for a motion, move into closed session for contract negotiations update with MAPE. Moved, Moved by Councilor uh, Biondich. Is there support? By Councilor Freely. Further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are now in closed session. Close the door.